Welcome to today's meeting of the Fire, Resilience and Emergency Planning Committee. Please may I remind participants to silence your electronic devices. Members of the public may like to follow at London Assembly on Twitter and use the hashtag AssemblyFire for this meeting. As we restart our public meetings, I would like to thank the London Fire Brigade for their work throughout the morning period. Um, London uh, was, was reassured and the brigade and its staff played a, a critical role in preparation, safety, incident management and ceremonial duties. And on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank all of the members of the London Fire Brigade. On the agenda today is a discussion on the outcome of His Majesty's Inspectorate of, Constabula of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services. That's the inspection of London Fire Brigade's effectiveness, efficiency, and its people. Before we begin, we have a few small items of business. Can I ask our clerk, Diane Richards, to confirm any apologies for today's meeting? Thank you, Chair. Apologies for absence have been received today from Assemblymember Duval. Many thanks. And can we note the list of offices held by assembly members? Noted. And can I also ask members if they have any disclosable pecuniary interests in specific items listed on this agenda? I take silence as none. And can we confirm the minutes of the meetings held on the 15th of June and the 5th of July 2022? Confirmed. And can we note the completed close and outstanding actions arising from previous meetings of this committee? Noted. Fantastic. And can we note the action taken by me as chair under delegated, delegated authority in consultation with party group lead members to agree the committee's response to the em emergency evacuation information sharing consultation? Noted. The committee's response to the reforming our fire service consultation? Noted. And the committee's response to the London Fire Brigade's draft community risk management plan? Noted. Fantastic. That brings us to our main item of business, which is a discussion regarding His Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary. I'm going to learn to say that word by the end of the day. I keep trying to say constabulatory, and that's not right. Constabulary, that's it. it doesn't come right off the tongue. And Fire Rescue Services, 2021 to 2022, Inspection of the London Fire Brigade's Effectiveness, Efficiency, and People. Welcome to our guests. We have Matt Parr, CB, His Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services. We have Andy Rowe, the London Fire Commissioner, Dr. Fiona Twycross, the Deputy Mayor for Fire and Resilience, and remotely today we have, we do have John Lamb, remotely he's the Regional Secretary for London of the Fire Brigades Union. Do we know what that beeping sound is? No, but I will check with our broadcasters. Hopefully Fantastic. It will stop. Great. So I will kick off with the first questions. The first question is for you, Matt. What are the key challenges for the London Fire Brigade in improving its performance, in your view? Sorry, just the microphone. Yep, morning there we go. all, and, uh, and thanks for the invite. Um, I, I've been in HMI now for five or six years, uh, and uh, luckily, I think, I'm the HMI that covers London in both policing and fire. Uh, and so I spend quite a lot of my time looking at uh, big and complex organisations, be it the LFB, London Fire Brigade. I'm also the HMI for PSNI, National Crime Agency, uh, a host of other fire and rescue services, but none on the scale of uh, London. Um, I, I would say the biggest challenge, and... and You'll see lots in the report, and I know you've got the report in front of you, uh, but you'll see lots of things that we think the LFB could do right. But ever more, um, I see some of the things that we, uh, we, we describe in the report uh, as symptoms, uh, not the underlying problems. Uh, and so in our first report, we, we were very critical, extremely critical, in fact, of, of training for incident commanders, for drivers, uh, and other areas too. Uh, and the LFB have, have resolved that, done really well. Uh, but what I wouldn't want to have is a kind of whack-a-mole approach where we find things that are wrong, point them out, and then the LFB deal with them. Uh, the big challenge for, for uh, Andy and his team is getting to a stage where 
the organisation solve those things for itself. Uh, it doesn't wait for us to point them out and then solve them. Uh, and I hate to use a word, but that's, that's, a, that's a culture and leadership problem, not a kind of structural problem of inspection uh, of the sort we point out. Uh, Commissioner and I have had this conversation on a number of occasions, but an organisation as big and complex as the LFB, or indeed the Met, doesn't really work properly uh, until everybody in positions of leadership all the way through the organisation recognises what the Commissioner and his top team are trying to achieve uh, and lives and breathes it on a regular basis. So if you have anywhere a culture of low standards, entitlement, complacency, uh, lack of professional curiosity, uh, if, if that's allowed to take root in an organisation then you will see reports like ours pointing out things uh, and every time it will be something different but there will always be something there. And the big challenge, in my view, for the LFB is to, to reach the point uh, where the organisation is healing itself rather than waiting for someone like me to come in and point out what's wrong with it. Thanks. That's, that's really comprehensive. And in terms of signs of hope of moving forward and improving, how do you feel the, the LFB is placed uh, to, 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 to meet those improvements that it needs to make. And, and as you're talking about, you know, it, it is a, it, partly a, a cultural issue. Um, what have you seen that would, that would give you hope or what haven't you seen? Um, I think uh, when you're dealing with an organization that's got problems like that, the first thing you're looking for is, is um, I always joke with people, and talk about the Alcoholics Anonymous 12-stage process, not that I've ever been through it, but I'm aware of what it is, and as we all know, stage one is to admit you're an alcoholic. And the worst organisations to deal with are the ones that won't admit the nature of the problems that they're facing. Uh, and if I'm honest, I think before Andy took over, uh, the organisation was very reluctant to admit the problems it's facing. It was instinctively uh, defensive uh, and... Um, too ready to believe its own PR. Uh, and I think that's changed. The atmosphere, we, we make a comment in the, port, in the report, the atmosphere uh, that we detect when dealing with the LFB is markedly different to what it was. Let's also reflect on the fact that um, two, major, two very significant things have happened to the LFB since I have been uh, uh, an HMI, or, or the, since the inspectorate returned or started inspecting fire and rescue services. Uh, the first one, of course, is uh, the tragedy at Grenfell, uh, and the second one is a pandemic, and those are related. Um, I think I've said publicly before, whereas many of the, whereas I have to say, you could, in isolation, look at the progress made since our first inspection to the LFB in 2018 and our second uh, this year, you could look at the progress between those two and be disappointed. Uh, and I think, you know, in bald comparison terms, that would be a fair conclusion to draw. However, uh, it strikes me as reasonable, uh, and if I'd been doing the Commissioner's job, this is where I'd be, uh, I think the most fundamental thing the organisation had to get with was the recommendations from the Grenfell Tower Inquiry. Uh, they were rightly prioritised over... Uh, many, if not all, but many of the, uh, the criticisms we had in 2018. Uh, and then they've had to deal with the pandemic, which has, and we see this in, in lots of the, uh, the, uh, the bodies we inspect, um, in some respects it's, added, it's, it's, it's acted as an accelerator to progress. Uh, and there are some things that have, where it's offered police forces and fire services uh, an incentive and a... Uh, and an opportunity to, to move things on faster. But there are other areas where it's, it, it's acted as a break. Uh, and so where, what would I say? <laughs> the atmosphere has changed. There's a good intent. There's no, there's no denial of the problem. Uh, there's no seeking to blame other people. Uh, there's a transparency and a recognition of the scale of the problem. Uh, it hasn't moved as fast as the Commissioner or, or I would have liked. But if you were to offer as a, as, a, as not an excuse, but an explanation of why that's so, uh, I think the interference with the pandemic and particularly the absolute, you know, existential for the LFB requirement to get to grips with the Grenfell Tower recommendations 
uh, strike me as, 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 as things you shouldn't ignore. Thank you for that. Andy, I'm going to ask you the same question. What, what, what gives you hope and, and that, that, that there's scope to improve and that things are moving in the right direction? Also, just to let you know, Matt, when you're finished speaking, if you can turn off your microphone because they start interfering with each other. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the first thing I'd say is I'd like to recognise that I think what Matt has just said is a very fair analysis. And I think the report you, you have in front of you is a very fair and objective report that speaks to both the complexity of leading change in a large organisation with a culture that has built over 160 years um, and some of the barriers to that. Uh, I, th I think if you were to ask me the question that you've just asked, Matt, what do I think? And I'd probably like to start the, the challenges. I think it is the leadership challenge. I said that in my first ever committee appearance here as Commissioner, that we can actually close the Grenfell Tower recommendations. I anticipate doing that within the year, broadly. So 26 out of 29 of the recommendations delivered against. You know, we can reverse some of the obvious high-risk issues in training. Um, we will address the recommendations laid out in the latest report from the Inspectorate with an energy I have both a duty and an expectation we will close them. But, and Matt is entirely correct in this, that does not address the things necessarily that aren't written. You know, how junior leaders see themselves, how my senior leaders behave to their teams, how that is embodied in a culture of professionalism that starts at the lowest point in terms of do you look smart, are you ready for the day, all the way up to and through my leadership. Um, so I, I would say that the opportunity is there. You know, I've been out across nearly three quarters of our stations this year. What I was hearing at the start of the year in terms of those conversations is different to what I hear now. But that is fragile and there are obstacles to that, whether that be the potential for a national pay dispute, which I hope we will avoid. You know, we're working very hard to, to avoid that. There will be the forthcoming review of culture, which obviously we commissioned ourselves. That will be a very hard read for the London Fire Brigade. I have no doubts about that. That will expose parts of our organisation um, in a way that is uncomfortable and unpleasant because we have not always behaved ourselves in a way that I think is commensurate with our, our own um, duties and reputation in the context of our history. That will be another hard moment that must act as a lever for change. Um, where do I think we are making a difference? I think if Matt and his colleagues were to come back today you know, because obviously inspection is a moment in time, I think they would already see a difference, particularly around the cultural piece, because we are now rolling out the leadership programme we have planned for so long. We are now having those conversations at every level, but changing a culture takes time and you cannot afford to be complacent. And I doubt, whilst I'm Commissioner, we will ever stop having these conversations, if I was to be frank. Thank you for that. Assemblymember Cooper. Thank you. Um, I'd like to address um, a question to Matt Parr and then to uh, the Deputy Mayor for Fire and Resilience. And reading the briefing that we've received, and I absolutely accept that there's a lot that needs to be changed in the Fire Brigade, and I do regular station visits and I speak to people from Andy yesterday at, uh, handing out 30-year um, um, commendations to people, 40-year, 50-year, um, but also speak to individual mem members of the watch in stations. But the, the briefing is also very clear that there has been a recruitment freeze, that there is a massive level of overtime that has been hugely increasing. There's a number of firefighters who've got second jobs. In a previous life, I was involved in trying to undertake improvement processes in um, housing associations and also in ALMO's um, arm's length management organisations and absolutely understand how difficult it is to make processes of change go forward. Do you think we need to contextualise this a bit in terms of staff who are clearly severely under pressure? I cannot believe that with a recruitment freeze and lots of people doing massive quantities of overtime, that it's easy to undertake things that are is crucial and essential, like pulling people out to send them on training and implementing new ways of working, because those do require investment in time and in staff that pulls them sometimes away from the front line. And we cannot have the brigade not available on the front line, can we? Um, thanks. Uh, uh, we see overtime, uh, I won't say as a bad thing. 
Um, but we're critical, not just in the LFB, but in a number of uh, fire services. When overtime becomes normal, normalised, uh, when it becomes... Endemic? When it becomes the only way of achieving the output you're required to do, then you're getting something wrong. Uh, overtime is there for specific purposes, uh, for um, uh, not only emergencies, but for exceptional circumstances and, and to, uh, to deal with the unforeseen and un unpredictable. Uh, if it's used as a way of, 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 of uh, normal routine planning, then you're getting something wrong. It's a little bit like um, we see in some organisations overuse of acting higher rank, for example, or you know, temporary, temporary promotions. If too much of that is going on, it's a sign that, that uh, in my view, work, workforce planning is not as slick and as controlled as it should be. Um, that doesn't mean it shouldn't, uh, shouldn't ever exist. Uh, I think your other point, with which I wholeheartedly agree, uh, is, is that of training. Um, a couple of the specifics that we've addressed with the uh, London Fire Brigade in our first report, I mentioned them, incident commanders and, um, uh, and drivers, um, they've, been, they've been dealt with. But then again, you know, if I was being cynical, relatively straightforward things to deal with, I know Andy will say it's more complicated than that, but very easy to see what the target is. I think more challenging, is the uh, the widespread uh, or, or the slightly wider analysis of what skill set you need your workforce to have, whether they've got it and how it's maintained at the right skills. And that's not just necessarily responding to fires and other emergencies, but it's a whole panel P of fire investigation, protection, prevention, all those other things. Uh, and as a general observation, uh, I would say that uh, few fire services do the training that they ought to in the in the clearly targeted way they should uh, and if you've got a lot of staff working on overtime then it, it stands to reason that you aren't going to that your chances of getting the right training are, are reduced thank you i wonder and if you could address the point about the recruitment freeze which i don't think is helping the level of overtime that's currently being undertaken it's just that context i'd like us to draw out that i think is quite important um thank i you. think I'll, I'll bring the commissioner in to talk about the work that's being done to reduce over time, because I think um, uh, in terms of the financial impact, that's something that we're trying to address. But there is there isn't a recruitment freeze anymore. Um, uh, I'd um, also like to sort of reflect on the chair's comments at the beginning and say thank you to the LFB for the work they did um, over the last couple of weeks. I think it's another example of the type of work uh, the brigade gets involved in, and it makes me hugely proud um, to be deputy mayor for fire and resilience. Um, your question, uh, Assemblymember Cooper, was around contextualisation. And so uh, I think it's quite an interesting one in terms of how, how the brigade can work in the context of a inspectorate whose role isn't, or who remit of the inspectors coming in, isn't to contextualise. It is to recognise that things might have put the um, fire brigade off course slightly in what is an incredibly huge piece of work around the transformation, which I was pleased that um, Matt Parr um, recognised in the press around the report, recognised the leadership of the brigade is really committed to and pushing ahead of. But it isn't actually, um, and it's not my role to defend how the HMI does it, but it isn't actually their role to contextualise it's to do a snapshot in time. So already we can see after six months since the inspectors came in, a lot of things have moved forward, but actually that's not necessarily reflected in the report. And I think it's right that the inspectorate focuses on the big things, the underlying causes of some of the issues they identify, rather than sort of, as, as uh, the inspector said, sort of that whack-a-mole thing. So I think... Um, uh, we couldn't have a situation, though, in which the brigade couldn't focus on uh, Grenfell, couldn't do things around um, COVID. But we do have to recognise that actually the inspectorate um, don't necessarily contextualise. They, they, they do a snapshot in time. Um, so uh, that can be tough when you receive a very difficult read. And I think the report was a very difficult read. But that's, that's the inspection model we have, and that's the one we need to work with and uh, reflect on in how we, we, we address the recommendations 
that are very helpful um, in, in a lot of senses, but it's still quite a difficult read. Thank you. Andy, did you want to add something? It was just really about the overtime issue. I, I think I'm in complete agreement with both Matt and, and uh, Assemblyman uh, Cooper that overtime makes me anxious. So um, just to give you an indication of where we are with this, we're running the biggest recruitment rounds that LFB seen in a generation. We're bringing in 25 new trainees a month and 25 transferees a month, particularly because transferees come with the skills we need, whether it's driving, whether it's instant command, and actually they bring a different perspective from other services, so there's some value in that. So I anticipate closing the recruitment gap by the end of the year, and I'm grateful that colleagues, uh, you know, at the behest of the Mayor have, in the GLA have released the money for enablers to do that. Uh, we weren't able to recruit like we wanted to, both structurally and financially, during the pandemic. Um, that has had an organisational impact. Mm -hmm. Um, we always prioritise training. That's why we're spending the overtime, because we still send people on training. But that comes with um, the, the kind of impact you, you've both actually described, which is people are working long hours. It's not ideal. You know, my colleague from the FBU is here. He will want to talk about resourcing at some point. Actually, you'll probably find we're in violent agreement with him. You know, we know that we need to get back to as full establishment as possible, set against our risk modelling, to enable us to hold a significant proportion of the workforce, sometimes up to a third back, to train, particularly. You know, if you look at the military and policing, they do that unashamedly, and rightly so, because they look to drive professional standards in specialist areas particularly. Um, how are we addressing it? Both by recruitment, but also, to be honest with you, just and, and this is again about legacy and how many things you can change at once, ripping up the way we schedule and allocate to training. You know, the LFB, um, at the moment, runs courses as individual allocation. That has a significant cost to it. We'll move 100 people from 100 different locations to maintain their individual competency rather than train them as a whole team. If you do that, as we found in the wildfires, whilst you can recall them to get more appliances back on the run in the middle of a crisis, it's both difficult, inefficient and expensive. Before the end of the year, we will be back in a place where we train whole watches together and have some sort of mop-up. We should never have stopped doing that. You effectively then have up to 30 appliances immediately available. So we're doing concrete things to reverse this issue. I meet monthly with my directors because I have direct ownership of reducing that financial pressure around over time. It's not just organisationally unsustainable. Financially, where I need to find £11 million worth of savings next year, where I might need to part fund a pay rise, I cannot keep on paying this level of overtime. And I would expect neither this committee nor the inspectorate to have any sympathy with me if it's sustained in that way. So I, I think what I've got to do is demonstrate the things we're doing, both in terms of that kind of assurance that things are changing, wholesale change to systems, very large scale recruitment um, is making a difference. And I will have to come back and demonstrate that to both my colleagues in the inspectorate and to yourselves as our scrutiny committee. Thank thanks you. very much to all, all of you. Sorry, Chair, I okay. intervened there, but yes. thank you. That was really helpful. Thank you. Um, John, I, can you now hear us? I know there were some technical issues. Yeah, uh, apologies. So I, I did miss the first 10 minutes. There were some technical issues. Uh, I'll just say regarding, so, and I hope I haven't, whatever I say hasn't already been covered, but actually a lot of what Andy says, you know, we, we would support him in. We do want to be at full establishment. We think it's important. Uh, we, I mean, obviously we've been raising the fact that we've had a lot of machines off since December last year we don't want to see machines off you know it has improved of late and i know that is because the recruitment is happening and there are people coming in from other brigades but we still had 17 machines off yesterday i mean we really do need to get to a point where all appliances are available all the time and actually we would argue we probably need an increase in establishment to actually facilitate the way we do the training and to allow that so there is more flex in the system so i mean we can't see ourselves in a position again where we we have the busiest day since the Second World War and we had 39 appliances unavailable. It, you know, the London Fire Brigade really should be built on being able to not only cope with that, but actually have more flex in the system so we could cope with more would be our position. Yeah, thanks for that, John, and good morning to you. Um, what impact has the report had on, on staff morale? That was a question for you, John. <laughs> I'm just wondering what your opinion is on the impact the, the HMI report has had on, on members of the fire brigade. Maybe, can you, John, can you hear us oh, now? Stop. 
But yes, so so if if I'm talking about morale, it, everything has an impact. I mean, obviously we're, you know, it, it is incredibly tough for our members. But what is also having an impact on our members and London's firefighters is actually the cost of living crisis. So I've I have had to fill out forms for London firefighters to go to food banks. We see it daily. I've got members who are living in fear with their gas and electricity bill. And like I said, we know we, we know what's going on at the moment and there, there is talk of balloting. Nobody wants to go on strike, but actually we're at that point now where, you know, the morale, if you, if you can't feed your children and you're worried about paying your rent or your mortgage, I mean, I know it is today they're looking at like probably the biggest interest rise on mortgages in 30 years. That will have a massive impact because people will need to pay those mortgages and that will put people's rents up. So morale, that is, if I'm honest, is probably the most effect on morale at the moment is the cost of living crisis and the fact that London firefighters cannot afford to pay their bills at the moment. Thanks, John. That, uh, it's uh, not surprising, but um, disappointing to hear that um, firefighters are also included with um, an increasing and very large group of people who are, are struggling. And um, it's it's a grim picture, but thank you for that. Um, coming back to you, Matt, um, I'm, I'm wondering how the London Fire Brigade's performance rates uh, alongside other fire and rescue services who are also struggling to deliver improvements. Um, I'm always loath to compare, and this is, this is an endless debate we have in the inspectorate. Um, what is a valid comparison to make? Uh, and uh, Fiona's right in that we don't. We, we try not to contextualise too heavily. We kind of come to, there's a standard. That's what good looks like, and we try to apply it to uh, every fire and rescue service and every police force that we inspect. Um, it, it, it does end up with some <laughs> comparing the Isles of, Isles of Scilly uh, fire and rescue service to, to the London Fire Brigade is not really a valid comparison. And whereas I might be stretching it a bit with that, I, I'd probably go further into pretty much you know the huge majority of fire and rescue services don't have the scale, the complexity, uh, the challenge um, that, that, that the London Fire Brigade faces. So it's a, it's a, that's just my way of saying it's a difficult comparison to make. Having said that, uh, the best fire services uh, do things that the LFB doesn't. Uh, they have a, uh, a, a grip on performance. Uh, they have an ability to change. Uh, they have uh, um, uh, cultures uh, that are conspicuously better and actually quite humbling and impressive in some cases. And when I say cultures, there's a, there's a tendency for, for us to think of that as uh, boorish behaviour, sexism, misogyny, racism, that sort of thing. I, I do mean that, but I don't just mean that. Uh, I also mean the culture of professional curiosity, determination to do everything to the highest standard, a genuine desire to serve the public over and above any, any, any individual self-interest. Some of the, the services we inspect uh, are quite humbling in the way that, that, that that's inculcated throughout the organisation. It's not in the LFB. Um, so I think if you look at sort of, I, I, I'm, I'm also very wary of looking at sort of scores on the doors and uh, making direct comparisons with grades, uh, but there aren't many. Uh, that I can think of with a set of requires improvement across the board uh, for every question we've asked, which is where we've got with the LFB. So in pure terms of, of uh, uh, our simplistic grading system, uh, I think the LFB is close to the bottom of the mark. Uh, but to take my earlier uh, uh, comments, it's difficult to make comparisons, and the challenge facing the LFB is in many ways significantly more complex than uh, the challenge of, of uh, running a relatively low population, uh, relatively low risk, rural uh, county fire service. They have their own challenges, but they're just easier to address than they are in London. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, Assembly Member Hall. Thank you, Matt. <coughs> that, that is really damning. Um, and it's really worrying for those of us looking at it, and I'm sure it is for the Deputy Mayor and uh, the Commissioner. I mean, you identified that 44 areas uh, require improvement across 11 metrics. Um, I was pleased to see that getting the right people with the right skills has improved, 
but therefore it, it, it beggars a question why understanding fires and other risks has worsened, preventing fire and other risks has worsened, responding to major and multi-agency incidents has worsened. Given your analogy of Alcoholics Anonymous at the fast, and, and it's true, uh, there is no doubt that Andy Rowe has uh, acknowledged there are issues, as has Fiona Twycross, no, no question about that. But with Alcoholics Anonymous, you do hope that at some point um, that person, please, will stop drinking. At what point um, do you think that we can start to see these issues being resolved and the, the, the whole, I mean, so many different issues? Because we can't keep looking at figures that are going down. We can't keep looking at worsened or needing improvement, um, inadequate. Because we're scrutinising this and it is not, it's not really going where I want it to be going. So when do you think that, I mean, alarm bells are right ringing to me now. When do you think that we should get to a point that we think, hang on, this just is not good enough? Um. There are two ways of looking at this, aren't there? There's, uh, the, the first thing I'd say is that um, this is our second round of inspection of all uh, English fire and rescue services. Uh, and the first time we did it, uh, it hadn't been done for a, a number of years. We did it, we were by definition doing it for the first time. Uh, I think our standards are a little bit tougher the second round. We've, lo we've learned more about the sector, they've learned more about us. Uh, we're better at knowing the good things to look for that, that are revealing about a, a service. Uh, and so there have been a number of fire and rescue services whose grades have, have slipped back a little, uh, or a lot in a couple of cases, uh, over the, between the first round of inspection and the second round of inspection. The LFB is not unique in that. Um, but that doesn't really detract from the, the point you're making, which is that uh, my main observation in the r report was that it, it is disappointing mm. to see that uh, good intent uh, and recognition of the problem and transparency about failings uh, has yet to be uh, reflected in the grades. We closed one cause of concern, uh, that was about training. Yeah. Uh, we opened two more. Uh, we'll be back to look at uh, uh, those two in the autumn or early next year uh, and again you know coming back to my whack-a-mole analogy I'm pretty confident that uh, the commissioner and his team will will deal with those quickly but to get to the stage where we want to be which is frankly the standard we aim at is good good is acceptable anything below good is requires improvement that's a, that's the way we work uh, to get to the stage where we're good across the board as some fire and rescue services are or indeed better, uh, that, that's a, that's a multi-year project. There's no question about that. Uh, it's not going to happen at the next inspection. Uh, my hope and cautious expectation uh, would be that if the Commissioner and his top team keep doing the difficult things but the right things, uh, we'll see improvements in a number of these areas. Uh, but it won't be across the board and it won't happen fast. Uh, that's that's the frustrating but realistic view of turning around big complex organisations with lots and lots of individuals in them because the improvement doesn't depend on what the Commissioner does, it depends on what everybody in the LFB does uh, and getting everybody to do the right thing is harder than getting it to, than doing it yourself. Yep, okay. Can I, can I just ask our FBU gentleman can you can you comment on that because these are your members some of them are lots that i know are splendid clearly some aren't because it is the people within an organization that make an organization can can you tell me what you think about this i think uh i think on our our members i think actually the 19th of july demonstrated what our members at the core are. They all worked incredibly hard and did everything they could to protect London. Uh, I think we're we're interested to what comes out of the uh, cultural review. I'm waiting to hear that. Uh, we asked at the beginning that cultural review would be from the top down 
and for every department. And to be fair to London Fire Brigade, that's what they're doing. So I think when that comes out, we'll be able to comment further. But do you recognise what is being said? Do you recognise this as being correct? Uh, so you're asking me if I recognise whether this... Are you recognising what Matt Parr is saying is actually correct? Do you agree with that? Because if you don't agree with what he's saying, tell me what it is that you don't agree with. If you do no, agree with I, him, I, I, then tell clearly me that. There are things, clearly there are things in the London Fire Brigade that need to be improved. And he is right that it takes everyone to do that. That will take time to go down, but I'm, I'm sure our members want improvement. They want the London Fire Brigade to be the best place to work. I think that's right. I mean, what he's asking for in improvements will take time, but hopefully we'll get there. And I'm sure he can count on you and the union to assist with that. We will always help support to make our members terms and conditions, time at work better. That's what we're here for. So we will support as we can. That's good to hear. OK, um, Commissioner, uh, are you confident that the LFB has the capacity and sufficient resource to deliver the improvements identified in the report? And how can you ensure that? Yes, is the short answer, because I think we're well resourced. You know, again, if I look across other services in the country, I think a combination of support from central government and the GLA ensures that we are well supported in that regard. Then there's a question about efficiency, which, again, we should be transparent about. We are not always the most efficient organisation. We have to be more efficient in terms of how we use that money, how we plan projects and how we um, assure ourselves that the outcomes we promised are what we delivered. So I think part of the challenge for me is that when I took over, I had various systems and structures that simply didn't exist for the LFB. And I know that was very disappointing for the people who have been scrutinising us. And I can only apologise, but I didn't have a business risk assurance framework. I didn't have um, cross-cutting boards, which you know is just normal in any other large organisation. We were still working in siloed boards. Um, we didn't focus on outcomes, so we didn't have proper assurance functions. So actually, part of the challenge has been building the corporate architecture that enables me to deliver any change at all. And we've had to do that from the ground up in a way that even, I think, surprised me when I took over. So I think part of why I'm more confident is because we've built that. It's reporting. I do have a monthly finance and investment board. We're getting a grip of overtime. Uh, Andy, can I just stop you there? Please. Um, if you'd come in from a different organisation, I could recognise everything you've just said that, but you were part of it. I, I was, but I was an operational lead. And I think that was part of the problem. We had all worked in silos. Many of us had done our entire career inside LFB, or like myself, I come from the Army to the London Fire Brigade. Part of my learning as a chief executive, and I'll be the first to admit it, is I've had to learn the business of, of corporate functionality. And I've learned that by bringing in people who are outside of the LFB. That's why we've effectively renewed the entire senior executive. I've had to... So, uh, so sorry, so are you making sure that people that were your level before... Uh, and possibly lower actually understand the whole thing because yes. clearly if you had no idea what was going on at that level we must make sure that people at that level going forward do know what's going I, on I couldn't agree more and that has been a very significant L effort in the LFB you know I, I will not be able to talk about the specifics but Fiona will attest to this I've had to I've had to change the senior leadership team at a number of levels in different ways you know and that has meant people leaving the organization it has meant bringing other skills in it has meant a significant program of education for our senior leaders so they understand that their responsibility is not just operational but is also corporate that in itself is a fundamental cultural and system change i'm very confident okay. that we're in that place but now we ma must manifest the okay. delivery that Matt rightfully demands uh, okay i've seen fiona wants to come in if that's right um chair and then matt um do you want to comment on what, what's been said? Um, I, I wanted to um, just comment on, um, I'm, going, I'm going to contextualise, having sort of said that isn't something that the HMI does. Andy was a director for a month before he took on the role of, um, of commissioner. And I think so he was not part of the director team for very long before he took on the role of commissioner. And um, in some ways that would normally be a disadvantage, but actually I think it had the advantage that he went from almost um, assistant commissioner to the more senior role and could actually see things with a fresh eye because he hadn't actually been part of some of the issues that um, 
needed to address but understood what it felt like to be an assistant commissioner and not understand exactly how things worked or what the issues were in in the other layers of of more senior management so I I think um, that context is important and I think that Andy and his renewed um, senior leadership team have got a really good sense of the issues faced by the organisation. Thank you, Chair. Okay, through through you, Chair Matt. Um, When we first inspected the London Fire Brigade, uh, I think I would characterise the organisation as uh, as well-led and poorly managed. Uh, and I separate those two. So there was a, a, a clear sense that the leadership team um, understood the front line, got on well with the front line, uh, had a degree of sort of inspirational uh, uh, leadership regarding the front line. But when it came to some of the basics of managing an organisation with that number of staff and that budget and that responsibility, uh, there were some horrible gaps. Uh, so things like change management and every organisation has to deal with change projects, uh, was near shambolic. Uh, human resources was, had, had practices that, that, that had uh, no place. And so Andy's comment about, you know, and he's been quite, you know, he's being understandably loyal and delicate about this, uh, but he's absolutely right. The whole senior management and the way the, 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 the organisation was managed rather than led uh, needed a complete overhaul. I, I, I get that. That has started. I completely support some of the appointments he's made, uh, and it can't have been easy doing that because you know that upsets people who have a sense of expectation about where their career is going to go and what they can do, uh, and that has been, in my view, rightly and necessarily uh, um, overhauled. So this is an organisation that 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 needed the kind of surgery at the top that, that uh, the current commissioner has, has imposed on it. Uh, and um, you know, who's to say whether that's complete or whether it needs to go further? But as I say, it's boring things. It's not necessarily about the glory stuff of responding to, to incidents, uh, uh, the, the way that's done. It's a slightly separate matter. But this was about the boring stuff of m- managing the money, the procurement, the IT, the estates, the, the contracts, the change programmes. Uh, uh, and that seems to me to be something that we should all have more confidence in now than we did four years ago. Yes. Well, of course, Fiona Twycross and I do need a certain amount of confidence, given that both of us have been dealing with the fire brigade for 10 years at a minimum, and we're always told everything was absolutely fine. So you can see my um, Andy cons- just wants to come concerns. I, I was going to ask you another question, Andy true that we've always been told that I've been speaking as the other person on the committee who's been on for only six and a half years in comparison but was on LFIPRA as well as the fire resilience committee I think there has been an acknowledgement that change is needed I think the issue that um, where we might come at this in a slightly different way is how the change is is achieved and and how whether it's going fast enough but I don't think there's ever been a time when I've sat in committees where the entire set of people from the brigade, um, whether they were people brought in by Andy or previous, um, I think you're my third fire commissioner that I've had the um, pleasure of working with, I don't think anyone has ever thought that there was nothing that needed to be changed. I think that's slightly unfair. I think perhaps you, Fiona, and I can have a private conversation on that because Fiona and I are are very often in in the same box on that one. Um, Commissioner, uh, you say you're well enough uh, resourced, etc., your last budget was taking money out of reserves um, to fund, which I don't think is um, financially sustainable. So uh, is, has that been fixed now? You can leave it at yes, and we'll deal with it in the budget committee. But I mean, that wasn't a good way of dealing with finance. The short answer is yes, and I would welcome the opportunity to talk about how we're going to use a, a different approach to efficiency to ensure we have a balanced budget moving forward. And that, and that we are resourced in the way we need to to meet the demands of the new CRMP. Okay, good, because it was disastrous last year. It really wasn't good at all. Okay, so um, do you agree with the findings of the inspection, Andy? Yes, I do. I acknowledge the report as a very useful marker in time of where the brigade is at. I, I think um, we agree with the vast majority of the recommendations. I think we may well get an opportunity on this committee to talk about fire safety because... 
I think that whilst the inspectorate had no choice other than to find what they did, there is a bigger question about the suitability of national frameworks that underpin that, which I think simply aren't correct for London. So there's probably one area of difference there, but that's not the responsibility of the inspectorate. They can only inspect the standard we work towards. If we need to change the standard, that's our business. Okay, and will the action plan responding to the report's findings be reflected in the transformation delivery plan and the community risk management plan? Yes, uh, and actually I think w one of the things I would say that was reassuring about this report is that there, there were very little surprises in it for London Fire Brigade. These were things we were already beginning to address, were in the plan, um, and I would expect as part of those wider strategic um, plans to be addressed. They, they're, they're entirely integral. Okay, good. Thank you. I'll hand back. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on now to the strategic direction and ability to deliver transformation. I just want to um, remind everyone so that uh, just we, we have a further five sections to get through. I mean, this is such a, a hefty topic, and so I, I won't be surprised if we do go a bit over time, but um, if we could. Uh, Keep, keep our, our answers. Um, I, don't, I actually don't want to say you need to be brief because that's not that's not right. Um, this is this is the forum to discuss this. But I just just to let you know, there's there's that many sections left, so we we don't want to keep you all day. Um, I turn now to Assembly Member Moema. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is a question for you, Matt. Um, what impact has the delay to the new CRMP had on the ability of the LFB to plan for the um, coming year? I, I think I can be brief on that one, um, Chair. Uh, it, it hasn't helped. Uh, I think uh, um, I understand the difficulty in sometimes uh, not just the LFB but uh, other fire and rescue services have in updating CRMPs. Uh, it, is, it is difficult for the leadership of any organisation uh, to make the plans they need to do if they, if, if they haven't got something to, to plan towards. So it was unhelpful uh, and it probably didn't help in the grades that we gave the, 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 the LFB uh, this year uh, in, in the head and outer date and um, CRMP effectively. Okay. And um, to Andy, um, will you have the um, updated um, CRMP, uh, del the delayed CRMP published this year? It, so it's scheduled for January within governance because obviously it's a stage now where we've completed our part of it and it sits within the GLA governance route for the mayor. To, to validate and obviously for it then to return, uh, you know, for further scrutiny. So yes, I'm very confident that we will. We of course do have an in-year delivery plan, but again, I agree wholeheartedly with Matt. I think actually the most painful criticism which ran as a thread through that report was the delay of our CRMP. If we had not mismanaged, and I take responsibility for this, the, the delivery of that CRMP in a prompter way, regardless of the challenges of COVID, I think we would probably receive a different inspection result because the reality is the inspector can only work on the plan they have in front of them, regardless of the good intent, regardless of you know, the draft plans they would have seen. That is our statutory document. We did and have done something different with CRMP. I know that the chair has been out to see our engagement with communities on the ground to drive a different approach to this. That was very much informed by the painful lessons we learned from Grenfell, where we stepped away from the community and frankly failed them. Uh, so we could not afford to repeat that. That would have been criminal. Um, but in trying to do something different, grappling with something we hadn't done before, a completely different approach to CRMP that is recognised, I think, now as best practice nationally, I'm afraid there was an inexcusable delay. And I know how frustrating it was both to the Deputy Mayor and this committee that that was the case. I take responsibility for that. Um, I think what we have to do is demonstrate that having planned in a completely different way and now delivered that CRMP for validation, we hold true to it and to the promises we've made our communities in its delivery. And just quickly, you said at the top of that that there was mismanagement of the delivery of the CRMP. Can you expand on what, what I just think that? we misunderstood the scale of the challenge we'd set ourselves. So we wanted it to be driven by communities. And actually, because we did not have a mature approach to community engagement at the start of this process, I think we're very much different now. Um, we, we misunderstood the scale of response we were going to get, where it was going to take us, the significant amount of amendment we were going to have to make to our initial plans. The level of consultation has been very significant. We had to go back for another round to validate that because the initial level of consultation. I don't think because we were doing something so different, we'd understood how much more challenging it might be to 
progress it through governance because people had rightful questions about mm. the different approach we were taking. So I don't think it was a lack of ambition nor the right plan. It was about how do you do something completely different with the right intent and then get it. And I think I think this speaks to a wider issue about our ability to be agile, understand the governance that is completely required to get things delivered. So I think I think that's where the big lessons lay. It was process rather than endpoint kind of delivery, but it absolutely did not help us in inspection because we weren't able to point to a, a plan that should have been there at that point. Uh, and I, I think there's no point trying to excuse that. Okay. And um, so when do you expect to have plans in place for um, states, fleet and IT that are aligned with the CRMP? Because Matt um, HMI have said that they've been a bit critical about how that's been managed in the past. But they're basically there now. So when, when that CRMP is live, it'll be live. And actually that, that points to one of the other points I was going to make, which is, again, if you, if you, if you want to understand what I faced when I took over, what my senior leadership team that's evolved over time faced, I didn't have an asset survey for what is the biggest, one of the biggest public estates in London when I took over. I had no sense of what condition my property was in. So I couldn't have a strategy because I didn't know what state my property was in. It has taken us a year and a half to do a proper asset survey across the whole of the estate that now enables us, and you know, it's a rightful challenge from Assembly Member Hall, to plan financially in a way that is cognizant with the risk and the, and, and the condition of that estate. So there was a basic step before we could even write that strategy because it would have been uninformed. Um, so all of those things have now been done uh, and they will be embodied in the delivery of the CRMP. Just, just so I'm clear, so the CRMP goes live in January um, and leading up to that you do, obviously all of those um, streams are within that. But yeah. what, so we will are you working to towards those up to or that doesn't start until that also goes live? We, we're clearly, we, we never stop regardless of whether a CRMP is published or not. And we're using things like the asset survey, the draft estate strategy, um, the strategy around fleet to deliver our business now. But... I mean, what I would also say is that in the past, and this perhaps reflects the previous London Safety Plan, we've been an organisation that creates a list of things to do that is static. And I, and I would like to suggest to the committee that, you know, London, and you've seen it both in the business of last week, in the wildfires in the summer, is shifting constantly. So part of the challenge for us is that we need to build a plan in the form of the CRMP that evolves those strategies. It's continuously moving, so it's not a fixed point in time. And part of the business of changing the brigade is to get a re regular rhythm of strategic cross-cutting boards that flex that strategy continuously, because things can change very, very quickly here. Um, so it's a question for you, Fiona. Um, do you agree with HMIC FRS that the um, fire brigade doesn't necessarily have the skills or capacity to achieve the level of change that's needed? Um, and um, how are you working with the Commissioner to address those issues, if so? So I think we can't really underestimate the scale of the challenge, and I think we've already sort of gone into some of that with some of the previous questions. And I think um, the uh, capacity is developing. There's a lot of strategies, and I think um, uh, we had Kate Bonham here who was talking about some of the initiatives that are coming through. The training has already been mentioned today, and um, the fact that there's been a major refresh of the senior team that is continuing. We've got um, a very, very different, um, uh, very different approaches being adopted. I think that um, they haven't been previously available, but this is changing. Um, so um, it's something that, as I said, sort of the HMI is a, is a snapshot. Um, I hope we don't wait until the next inspection to to get a sense that it has changed. You should start feeling a sort of step change in some of the reports and some of the information you're getting through this committee in the meantime. But I am confident and I hope that the HMIC FRS will be able to see that in their next inspection. That will be reflected. We're going back to the previous uh, points that were made about the lack of an up-to-date CRMP. That's a really hard lesson, but it has been learned. And I'm confident through sometimes very difficult conversations with the commissioner and his team about that, that they do recognise that that was a big issue 
um, and that actually they hadn't really um, understood that they weren't really giving the HMIC FRS the, the sort of the the tools they needed to be, to have something up to date to to measure performance against. Thank you. And there's a question for you, John, on the screen. Um, are your members positive about the changes being introduced um, to LFB and the improvements that they aim to deliver? I, I think there's still a piece to be done with our members exactly what's happening. As I said, it's it's not in yet. Uh, if I'm honest, you know, as far as London safety plans go, this was probably the first one in my career where it hasn't involved wanting to shut fire stations. So it's a very, very different process. Uh, as I said, it's an education piece and, you know, I think there needs more needs to be done for it to land at fire stations and all over the service. And, and it's talking and seeing where people are. But I think once people can see it and there's actually some something happening from it, it will probably that's when people will probably understand it better. Because at the moment it's not in and it's what we're going to do. I mean, we have been consulted and have done some work on the CRMP. We've got a meeting next week with Fiona Dolman. Uh, I know there's some stuff regarding the aerials that, you know, what they're looking at that actually, you know, possibility of looking at seeing if if more would be an improvement which we're quite happy with but I think at the moment there's still still a ways to go okay and just um if you if I can just come back to you on that so when you say there's a way to go what what kind of di divergence in direction of what's been proposed or kind of concerns what do you have? Fire members I, I think it's just you know there's, there's still a bit of work to be done that people on fire stations have an absolute clear view of the CRMP and I think that won't happen until it comes in really you know once it starts to happen it will become less opaque and people will actually start seeing what it means there'll be a much greater understanding I mean like I said there's a lot going on at the moment and you, you know our, our members there's, there's a lot going on with them and like what they're having to deal with in their own life. It's been a busy couple of years and he's touched on it, the wildfires. Like I said, there's discussions that we're having regarding training. I, I would agree with Andy, there's a much better way for the London Fire Brigade to do its training, which would have less of an impact on the people who have to do it. But we're having discussions about that. But it's, it's when those things start to happen, I think people will gain a more positive understanding of these things and understand them better. Okay, so basically it's a bit theoretical right now. Yeah. I think so. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Just like Andy wants to come in. Yeah, I'll, I'll make it brief. I, I think what John's pointing to is an issue with communication. I think he's right to. It's about how you take something that's inherently corporate in its nature, simplify it in its communication. Because at the end of the day, this is about what do, do firefighters do for their community? What do our inspecting officers do for their community? How do we bring our community into? our stations in greater numbers, how do we get out there more effectively to meet the risk in those communities? I do not think we have effectively yet explained that to firefighters and the benefits it brings. I think that is the next challenge with CRMP and I think John is right to highlight that. So I think he's been quite courteous. I don't think we've got the communication of this right yet. It's, so it's, it's one of the significant risks of my corporate risk register mm -hmm. uh, and there is a fairly serious effort underway at the moment to consider how we use uh, um, a different approach to leadership and communication down through the layers of the organisation to ensure that this plan is delivered in reality rather than a plan on paper. So um, just if I can follow up on that, um, isn't there a risk then that um, when the plan is agreed and it kind of goes live, that if it's not effectively communicated to, if you like, frontline workers, that nothing really changes? I mean, how... It feels like the communication piece is fundamental, but it's probably the most important bit. So if all of this work happens corporately, but um, brigades don't change their behaviour, then we'll be back here in a year's time yeah, and you'll you're, continue you're to get right. bad reports. I mean, I think what I would say is that, again, we're not waiting for January to communicate that. I think the chair reflected in a meeting I had with her yesterday that she'd been out on the ground and was listening to um, junior officers on watches talking about CRMP talking about that in a community setting to members of the community. So we have started that. We've been engaging that for months. But again, this is a big organisation. What I've got to do is kind of close the deal. And I think that's what John's reflecting, which is he knows about this. We've consulted very widely with John about it. We have heard their concerns. We've begun communication with our staff and his members. We just have to avoid any complacency in that. And we have to continuously simplify. Again, I'll, I'll note Assemblymember Hall's comments on other committees. We have to remove the business language and make this real because it, it's only real in the delivery to communities. So that is our main effort. 
I think we're doing that. I think members of this committee have been witness to it. I wouldn't be complacent enough to think we're there because I think that communication piece, you are right, is the single greatest vulnerability and we must focus on it to now make this plan real. Okay. Uh, John, you wanted to come in? Yeah, it was just, just on a point because I think fire safety was invest was uh, mentioned there and it, it's a bit of a sideway, but, you know, we do we do have some concerns and we know what's in the report, but we are seeing a large number of uh, firefighters and inspecting officers. They, they seem to be, you know, almost leaving for better paid jobs and we think that isn't that could be an issue going forward, actually people leaving to go to better paid jobs in other organisations. So there, there needs to be something done to adjust that there. But it was just because it was mentioned. On the other point in communication, yeah, I, I think it's when people understand and know that that will help a great deal, if I'm honest. Thanks for, thanks for that, John. And Andy, just as you prompted me, I do think I, I have picked up on examples where CRMP is reaching right across the fire brigade. And, and as you mentioned, I went, um, I, not, not that I need to announce, but I did not I did not tell the fire brigade. Uh, it, it was the, the West Hampstead uh, watch had, who'd come over to uh, uh, visit a, a festival on Cricklewood Lane, and they were welcoming people not not just on the fire, uh, not not just onto the to the vehicle, but but having conversations about fire safety and um, safety within homes and 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 that sort of thing. And it was it was really good engagement. And I had a nice conversation with them, and I I asked them, um, you know, why they were there and, and why this was important. And they said it's really important that we. We, we speak with all communities and that we're engaging and we're you know being outward looking and they they really un under understood and were reflecting those values so I think that was that was an excellent example anyway um, assembly member Bailey um, morning to our guests um, one of the statements that jumped out of the report uh, to me Andy was without an up-to-date CRMP it isn't clear how the brigade its budget finance and staffing plans will meet um, identified risks. Because of this, plans for efficient and effective use of estate and fleet haven't been developed. Now, we, we've, we've spoken a, a lot in this committee about the what's wrong, and, and, and that's the nature of this committee. What I'm interested in is, is, is this. What actions are you taking to ensure that project management is undertaken and monitored effectively? Because if you listen to this meeting, the CRMP is the biggest project, or certainly a big one, and it clearly wasn't monitored it, it, it didn't have a direction of plan it wasn't planned out what are you doing now to make sure that that doesn't happen to this and also other projects you have going in your organization so i think a lot of the actions have already been taken and, and obviously this has to happen concurrently at the same time so from the start of my commissionership we're planning a new crmp mm -hmm. um well very simply setting up a project management function a proper program office didn't have one of those so mm -hmm. actually hiring people in with project management expertise not assuming that um, just because you're a really good operational uniform officer, you know how to manage a project. That's a different discipline. Training some of those uniform officers to be project managers where appropriate. So a significant inward financial investment to do that. The hiring of actual people and teams and capability, a new system in terms of IT to run projects. The building of an assurance function from scratch, which is well underway so that we can actually define the outcome of the project that's delivered going from a place where we didn't have a an internal finance board. All we, all we had was um, meetings uh, across the organisation within the rhythm of the GLA budget cycle. So we now have a monthly finance and investment board chaired by a new director of corporate services that actually came from Parliament, who is taking, I would say, a more professionally sceptic eye to our finances. Um, a commissioned efficiency review that articulates how we will close the financial gap next year and and within the context of those boards I'm already seeing hard decisions being taken whether it's around the deletion of posts that people haven't been able to fill or whether it's the stopping of projects that weren't achieving the outcomes we expect in CRMP so I think again it's about um, a fair reflection in a moment in time and a sharp reminder that this stuff has to deliver but I think we've taken a lot of the actions both corporately uh, and at an operational level to address this. I would expect a return on that investment, both in terms of cashable savings and better outcomes in terms of that delivery. I can't have another report which says we don't manage our projects and we don't have a grip on the outcomes of delivery. That's not 
Really? Okay, that, that's that's it. That, that's an answer. How are you ensuring that changes are being effectively translated and adopted within watches? Because the other big conversation we've had this morning is is largely been about culture, and I think I, I hesitate to use the word easy, but it's easier to change senior management culture than it is to change culture on the watches right down to the front line. So how is that being handled? Um, I, I just, I just as well, Dave. I'll come to you with this question as well. So just start to think your thoughts through. But how is that being handled? I think we're back to the deeper seated stuff that Matt articulated at the start, which is it's, it's a, a set of concurrent activities. So structurally, it's about changing our communication model with watches. So building monthly watch briefings. It's about the fact that I'm out at least once a week visiting multiple stations. Tomorrow I'm out on Paddington, Soho, and Lambeth. You know. I, that's never going to stop as long as I'm commissioner. So there's a sense check at every level. Um, we have changed leadership in key positions at an area command level and at a borough command level. So that, that change in leadership is expressed down and through to a kind of an operational level that has a direct contact with frontline firefighters. It's about um, putting every single junior leader on a watch onto a face-to-face -face leadership program. It is about manifesting... Um, series of conversations about basic standards which i think inform everything else uh, as well as what we're delivering um, that is how we address it and then the second part of this and i think it's a part where we were again extremely vulnerable at the point i took over and we are not at the end point of this yet i would not claim that is building a proper assurance function it isn't just about coming and reporting the numbers of things we deliver to you very good at counting things the fire brigade you know, historically very good at telling you we've met a percentage, but actually coming to you with clear evidence that there has been an outcome, i.e. have we reduced fires in a particular risk area? Have we seen a drop in fatalities? Are we getting to things quicker? Are we resolving things in a, a safer way in terms of, you know, less firefighters injured? Can we point to a genuinely robust staff survey that demonstrates people have a different approach to delivering our business? So I think it's multi-layered. But it's something we're thinking about all the time because your question is correct. If it is not delivered in reality out of our fire stations, then it is just a corporate plan. And you're and you're happy with the mechanisms you have to monitor this because the bit that really interests me is a human interaction right down at, 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 at you know core staff level because you you, you unfortunately had a, a firefighter who, who committed suicide and some of the comments that he had made, I I, I don't see how all this corporate speak will have, will, have, will, have, will have made it easier for him. How are you going to make sure that you change that actual interaction between firefighters in a positive way? Are you sure that that's been addressed? And how are you going to monitor it, it, that? It hasn't been addressed yet. I, I wouldn't, I, I, and I wouldn't use the word happy because I, I'm not happy about okay. it because this is a much longer term journey. With what you're really talking about there is fundamental change to the culture of leadership, particularly at every level, from my office down to your junior leader on a watch who are really the backbone of the service these are the people running the service every day mm -hmm. until you have shifted their relationship with the organization their view of themselves their understanding of what professional means you will not get the change sustained we are not there yet we are a long way in to you know creating the circumstances in which it will but we are by no means at the end of that journey. And, and actually, it, it, it happens at every level. It happens in terms of the corporate change we're talking about, so the building of corporate structures. But it's also about personal investment by leaders at every level. It's why I'm out on every single fire station this year and why that will carry on indefinitely so I don't lose touch with the shop floor and tell myself stories about how well it's going. Because trust me, firefighters are very clear to me about what they think is working and what there isn't. So that it stretches from me. My expectation of my leaders is the single most important thing they, they must do is spend time with their direct reports regularly and really get under the skin of how those people are experiencing work and hold them to account. We're not there yet. I, I think we have to see how these leadership programs roll out. I have to see how the change in leadership in key positions within the organization then makes a change. And then I have to see how our assurance function, which is going to take a different approach. You're putting it bluntly, it's very simple stuff. It's not corporate at all. It's people going out on the ground before Matt's inspectors get to us and asking similar questions. Okay. So, a, a, you know, an internal independent assurance function that's focused on outcomes and doesn't let itself be blindsided by, you know, our own mythology, I guess. Okay. Um, it's a question for Dave. Can you hear me, Dave? 
John. Sorry, it's John today. John, sorry, John. Excuse me. Excuse me. That's entirely on me. Excuse me. It's Christopher John. But in my defence, it says David here. Um, John, you, you made a, a, a comment early on that you see the, the, your, your union's role as to protect the terms and conditions of your members, which, which makes sense. But do you also, are, are you helping the fire brigade improve? Are you having conversations with your members about what, you, what they can do, what you can do collectively to help the fire brigade improve and measure some of that improvement? I mean, we're constantly having branch meetings, talking to our members about what's affecting them. We've got an all members meeting today in London, actually, with the general secretary coming down to discuss stuff with us. Uh, yeah, we talk to them. I mean, our members will constantly tell us what's affecting them. What's, you know, if I'm honest, it's what makes their life at work not pleasant. What is making it pleasant? We look around and see where, you know, the best things are doing. You know, you sort of need a consistent approach. I mean. It, Sometimes it's little things. It's it's the ability and actually training is effective here. So actually we have people who, unfortunately, because they've got certain skills, cannot cannot move from a station they may not want to be to. That, now, that could be loads of reasons. It might be family, childcare. They just fancy a change, but they, they can't, you know. And like you said, and I appreciate not everyone can be exactly where they want, but it's that ability to be flexible and to move people about and make people happy. You know, I mean, it's... It is incredibly hard for our members. Like I said, there's a lot of things like training is an issue. You know, sometimes people are, are actually told they have to go training on an off shift day. For some people, that's fine. If you're a single parent or you've got childcare, you know, you've got childcare issues, it becomes a big problem. And it's the little things like that that they will talk to us about. And when you talk about what we can do to help, uh, you know, we, we deal with the London Fire Brigade on consultation. We help as we can. You know, you know, we always, you know, always try to help even if you go back to actually you look at how people are the appliances off the run when you're at a multi-appliance station and your pump's been off the run i'm full, and i admit it's getting better but it's been off the run for a month and you're constantly being sent on out duties which then takes you longer to get to less time at home with your family that has an effect so that's the stuff our members will ask us to deal with i mean if you're talking about what they can do to help us, we, we do have members come forward and branches come forward with what they would like to do and we always have those open discussions with them. Do, do you feel like you're part of the mechanism to to effectively communicate these changes that, that are being asked for? So you've got a lot of people from the corporate end saying, we'd like to see this happen, we'd like to see that happen. Are you actively being part of that mechanism and are you recording that? Because I think the challenge, one of the challenges the Fire Brigade has, has had is to properly manage projects do you feel like you're part of managing any of the projects is it something you think you could help with as as an organization so uh yeah so uh, not all projects i mean uh if, if i'm honest we were heavily involved in the uh command unit integration project because it was a negotiated thing which we engaged with you know can, you know we will engage we've got the jcf joint committee for firefighters where we meet every month where we discuss most issues you know rank to roll heavily involved in how that worked, which, you know, brought some improvements to the, in my view, and I'm sure in Andy's view and all, brought some massive improvements, i.e. front-loaded training, the you know, ability for people to be trained before they start doing, acting up to do something. Do you know what I mean? So we will always, when when the London Fire Brigade wants to engage us, we will always engage. I, I won't say they couldn't do a better job of engaging with us at times, but, you know, we can always do better at everything. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, assemb assemb assembly member Moema. Thanks. Just really quickly, um, if I could follow up um, with that, John. And if I'm wrong, assembly member Bailey, please let me know how I've understood your question. But um, the engagement with um, of the FBU and your members on the issue around kind of culture and that change, the sort of intangible stuff that probably is what will make or break the success of the changes in the brigade for frontline people. How how big of a role do you have in that or do you see yourself having in that? So less about the kind of appliances and so on, but about the cultural shift that needs to happen, which you are in a probably unique position to influence, the, whether that's received positively or negatively. We, we are the voice of London's fight. We are the voice of our members. And we, we always engage in all of that, like Andy, I'll tell you, we engaged with the CRMP. We have had meetings regarding the culture review. Uh, and like I said, we will always, I mean, we will always be directed by our members. But like I said, you know, our job as a union is to ensure our members have the safest, 
best place to work. That's what we're here for. So any improvements and anything that's going to improve the life of our members, we'll obviously we'll support. Okay. I just saw Dr. Twycross indicated. Thank you. In the context of the culture review, I think the single biggest contribution um, the FBU made was to point out that it shouldn't just be about watch culture. It should look at the whole organisation, which actually reflects what um, the inspectorate found in terms of looking at culture as a, as a whole, not just looking at we've got one issue in one place. So I think that um, they've played a really constructive role in making sure that piece of work is broadened out and will ultimately sort of come with greater dividends. It isn't their job to sell what management's doing to their members, um, and Andy's alluded to the need to get comms uh, better, but I think uh, the FBU um, in London play a really constructive role, and fortunately for us, in terms of the role I'm doing, the role you're doing, um, Andy and his team listened to it when they pointed out that actually maybe the culture review could be of the whole organisation piece rather than just one small part of the organisation, albeit sort of the one that um, uh, most of the staff sit within. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm sadly going to have to give another bit of a time warning. Um, we've got 45 minutes remaining in the scheduled time and we still have three three sections to discuss. Um, so just a remind to assembly members and to, to our guests, it's lovely to hear everyone's contributions and really interesting conversations, but I, I'm aware people have other meetings throughout their day. Um, so we move on now to protecting those most at risk from fire, which is going to be led by assembly member Bakari. Thank you, Chair. Um, the inspection report uh, found that the LFB was not maintaining its risk-based inspection program well enough. Uh, audits, there are backlogs, um, high-risk premises, overdue inspection, staff admitting that they weren't routinely carrying out audits. Why has this gone so badly wrong? And can you tell me what progress has been made since by the LFB to improve the situation? Yep, happy to. Um, the first thing I'd say is that this is probably the one area where we had significant debate with the inspectorate. Because uh, whilst I fully accept that um, the inspector has to inspect against the standard that is set at the time, we're back to CRMP again in, and LSP, the national framework around risk-based inspection, part of what the inspection reflects is conversations with staff on the ground who are under pressure to meet targets that make no sense for London. Um, so the reality is some of those high-risk premises you're talking about are not high-risk. So if I followed the risk-based inspection program in its totality, I wouldn't have looked at any of the 9,500-odd high-rise buildings that I think Her Majesty's Government quite rightly wanted me to look at post-Grenfell. They're, they're not in there. Um, this is a plan that was written pre-Grenfell. This was a plan that was written before we understood the scale of risk in much of the built environment in London. We are working... My answer to this is within the new CRMP, you will find that we do not follow this model of a risk-based inspection program, and I won't chase a target, um, regardless of the fact that I have responsibility to deliver CRMP sooner, um, that doesn't make sense for London. So I think what we're talking about is a legacy issue, because our inspectors are by quite a long way the most productive inspectors in the country. They deliver, um, on average, about 50 inspections a year compared to Liverpool, which got a good rating, where each inspector will deliver between 20 and 30. So they are already extremely productive. We have the largest proportional um, fire safety department in the country. We have built an academy which, despite the challenges, and, and John is right to point this out, by the way, the challenges of the external market is growing um, a base of people in numbers that is unrivaled in any other service. We have, you know, and it was inexplicable to me that we stopped doing this 20 years ago anyway, we have once again ensured that the whole of our operational workforce is delivering fire safety, which will again give us a base of people who become increasingly skilled to then draw the future inspectors uh, through that academy process to meet the need of what I think will be a very significantly different approach to audit and risk. So numbers in uh, London are a red herring. It's important that you do complete thousands of visits, but they need to be thousands of visits in the right place. Because to put this in a context, we have a third of all businesses in the UK and London, over a million, more than any other country in the UK. We visited already 
this year, over 18,000 of those via watch visits and a combination of inspectorates. There isn't another service in the country that has to face that or deal with that volume. Therefore, you've got to be very careful about where you put your resources and how you dip test into the areas of highest risk. It's a combination of operational intelligence followed by very focused audit rather than chasing a number. So I, I have full respect for the inspection's findings. They had no other choice because we did not present them with a different model, but they will be presented with a different model next time that I expect us to meet. Would you be able to share that model with us as well and, and also kind of clarify the the issues you've just mentioned about these audits? Because we, we do want to have a really full picture here yeah. um, and it will be really good for us to have an idea of those the overdue audits and what is what you class as high risk and not high risk and just having that clarity will really help us yeah because I, I don't think we'll close that backlog set set against the old um, mm. risk-based inspection program hfsvs are something different we've cleared the backlog that the inspector identified there we are going to take a different approach there in terms of who we visit how we visit you know the better use of digital safety checks for example and, and a, a greater focus on group community engagement and safety advice. So that will change as well. But we recognise that within the model, we needed to clear the backlog of HSV. So we've just done it. That's done. Risk-based inspection programme, I'm really clear about. What I don't want my inspectors doing is going out and inspecting buildings when I need them to deal with the daily rhythm of stuff we now know to be higher risk. So I think, I think it's really important for us to bring to this committee or to you know individual members where we think that plan is evolving and changing it does require national change so we're working very hard to both lobby and help design a different sort of national architecture based on um, uh, risk-based inspection for particularly for large metropolitan areas but i'll be I'm happy to bring that detail to committee thank you now there, there was some praise about the up-to-date risk information that you do have but there was some criticism of how that information is stored. Uh, there was ad hoc emails, verbal updates, um, and now you are now putting some uh, IT systems in place to to fix that. But it's not going to it's not going to take for, for until two thousand twenty four. So what's the delay? Um, the, the so we we've got three separate systems that hold information on risk. So probably the most painful moment for me in the whole of the Grenfell Tower inquiry and there were many painful, painful moments as an AC in the first phase and then as commissioner in the second phase was having to explain how we held risk on the same building in the context of the Grenfell Tower um, all articulating different sorts of risk operational risk in terms of the renovation of the building not knowing that it was a dry riser rather than a wet riser um, having carried out you know multiple hfsvs there and not noticed or recorded that there were door closers because that was on a separate system having inspected it and recorded some adverse results and then not communicating across three these three different systems the sit the information across those systems is being brought together now in advance of a completely different system that will act as a whole will be the first place in the country to try and do it on this scale so we're building something from scratch so that's a very long-term it project we're not waiting till then to share information across the system so there are things in place in the interim to ensure those systems talk to each other and information is shared across all staff groups because obviously what you want and what we would have wanted at Grenfell is when those firefighters who at that point weren't trained to carry out fire safety advice nor identify risks you know we'd stopped doing that 15 years before with the, the coming of the regulatory reform order um, you would have expected them to pick up on all those door closes that were missing and then report it but that didn't happen so that the inspector is right to identify the risk but there's already been a lot of work done to share that information and it will not be 2024 that we reach that kind of complete endpoint that's happening now but there needs to be a better single database for risk in London that will take time to build not least because there is not one single gazetteer that gives an accurate um, uh, risk-based analysis of all the buildings in London so we're, we're having to work with a lot of other external stakeholders to construct that thank you and I really appreciate the fact that you have taken on board what the report has said and and picking up on that the you did mention this earlier about um, uh, staff, but uh, it'll be good to have both the Deputy Mayor and yourself uh, answer this question. Are you confident that the LFB have uh, has enough protection staff to fully deliver 
all its building safety audits and assessments, including its risk-based inspection programme? Uh, not at this point, no. But that, that's really why there's a significant organisational effort being made to build a resilient system rather than constantly being in this merry-go-round of losing staff to higher paid employment because we cannot compete with those wages. They're double quite often. So one of my fire safety inspectors at a relatively inexperienced junior level can walk out of a 30 to 40k job into a 60 to 70k job outside because the coming of a building safety regulator, all the changes that have come from Grenfell rightly at a governmental level has now placed a premium on that that um, competency out in the market because there's different responsibilities on developers and builders and all the rest of it. We're, we're in that competition. We're never going to meet those wages, so we've got to incentivise it a different way. It's got to be part of a different career route for people inside LFB where they come in and out. Um, we are looking at wage differentials. We'll do our best, but the real approach is this academy approach. Again, that, that has taken years to get off the ground. It's, to be fair, started before I was commissioner. That was one of the pieces of work that started before. It's coming to fruition now, but that is a constant battle. That's the reality of market forces and a lack of investment nationally in those skills. There is simply not enough fire engineers, fire safety inspectors in the country to satisfy that demand. Do you have a target number of what, uh, of how many you want and, and a, di yeah. a time scale? Yeah, we have. So we've got clear targets and a time scale. I'd, I'd have to come to you with that detail. I haven't got it sat in front of me. Uh, but in order to deliver the risk-based inspection programme we're going to end up in, we've got a clear understanding of what we need to do that. Um, and, and I mean, there's other criticism in the report, which you might come to you later, for example, around building safety regulation consultations, where we've had to trial a different approach, which we'll now expand. So that'll be a good example of hearing the criticism in the first report in 2019, trialing an approach, probably not quick enough to get to the final point, but now expanding that, having seen it worked, where we know exactly how many people we need and ha a model that will work to close building safety kind of regulatory business much quicker. Assembly Member Cooper. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's the same sort of area really about um, improvements which are covered in the report about the home fire safety visits um, and recommendations about making sure that there's an action plan. And obviously they're quite crucial in terms of uh, reducing the number of fires in the first place, it's part of the preventative area. Um, do you now have a very clear action plan that sets out a very clear hierarchy and priority order? Because obviously if someone's on oxygen or if someone is, you know, is, is at home and is, is covered in paraffin jelly, um, or if someone is on oxygen and covered in paraffin jelly, you know, there's a whole series of different indicators or hoarding, you know, there's a series of different um, uh, reasons why home fire safety visits should be carried out in a priority order. Has that all been resolved now? Broadly, yes. So we wrote back to the inspector with an action plan. I think Matt reflected this earlier that he would expect us to close that cause of concern and it was right to identify it. We've cleared the backlog that had grown over COVID-19 because people didn't want us in their homes. I think we have to accept that. Um, but actually, the, the greater issue for me is how we prioritise those visits and assess risk. So we have got a plan in place to completely revise the way we analyse risk at a borough level, how we work across partnerships to do that, embodied within individual borough plans. So it'll be different borough to borough. So what you do in the city with a much lower residential population will be vastly different to what you do in Newham and will be mirrored both in terms of the analysis of risk and the visits where we deliver them. I think there's got to be a greater focus on digital. One of the things that we learnt... Um, you know, positively out of COVID is the vast majority of people get what they need from HFSV online and therefore you need to save that longer visit delivered by what is a fairly, you know, inefficient method, i.e. sending a crew or even an individual to a house for those people who are highest risk. But the way we delivered it within the local area teams didn't ensure there was a consistency of approach in analysing that risk. That's changed now. That's driven from the centre and that's what the action plan reflects. Okay, can I just ask that of John? Do you feel that there's been um, a change in the way that the priority is being relayed to uh, FBU members, the LFB staff, in terms of where the home fire safety visit should be carried out? Is that clearer now to everybody, would you say? I think it is slowly moving in that direction and actually we, we welcome that consistency and actually 
directed approach. We think, you know, really it's, it's about quality, not quantity, quantity. And actually those people that really need it should be the ones who get it as a, you know, and Andy's right, if it can be done digitally, you know, is, is it efficient to send a crew of five round a house if actually that could be done online? You know, it's better to save those crews. Because to be honest, you know, they have time, but then they have shouts. So you can't always guarantee you're going to be able to get to them even when they're booked in. So it's it's really about that consistent, targeted approach for us. I think it is starting to sink in, but it, it, will, ta it, it will take a little bit of time and it will be the area teams will do that. But yeah, I, I do think there is a general direction that my members are seeing. Because it is, it is crucial, isn't it, John? Because obviously people, um, for promotional reasons or you know reasons of operational necessity, do move from one borough to another, don't they? So does it help when people move from, I don't know, Newham to Wandsworth, that they're following the same set of procedures? I would think actually the London Fire Brigade, it's always best when everyone knows exactly what they're doing. So it doesn't, you know, so policies aren't misread and things aren't done differently in other boroughs and other areas so we would always want everyone to be you know working to the same rules so yeah obviously if you if you move if it's done exactly the same that's much much better for you thank you thank you chair assembly member i'm going to be really quick because i know timing i just want to say andy I'm, i am concerned about the data that is kept and 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 I picked up something the HMI said and talking about the CRMP. This means it's under the delay to it. This means it's underpinning assumptions and data. Uh, it, it, it's underpinning assumptions and data are more than four years old. So the brigade's plans and directions aren't aligned with the LSP. I'd, I'd leave that because I know that could be a whole conversation, but I am concerned about how old some of the data is that they, you're then making assumptions on. I, I don't think we are. I, I think that what Matt has rightly criticised there is that all the inspectorate can consider in terms of a strategic plan is LSP. I, I think the disconnect is we are using different data and we are effectively working against a different set of assumptions than what is stated in the extant strategic plan. We work on live data. We've undertaken a colossal operational assessment of risk for the new CRMP. We are, you know, we are not meeting our targets under the old risk-based inspection programme because we know that doesn't um, fully um, recognise the risk that's in London. What, what's inexcusable is in the, not having the new CRMP in place. Matt can see quite clearly this disconnect where you've got a list of strategic priorities that you know we are delivering against that aren't actually matched by the underpinning data we're now using. That that I have no excuse for. Uh, no. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Absolutely fine. Thank you. Um, th and thank you, Andy. And we're now moving on to uh, responding to major and multi-agency incidents, which is going to be led by Assembly Men Member Rogers. Thank you. And my first question was for Matt, so I'll, I'll hold that back until he comes back into the room. Um, so in that case, I'm going to go to, to Andy. Um, one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the factors that um, HMI noted uh, was that um, LFB performs far fewer exercises with neighbouring services than the national average. Um, I'll, I'm going to caveat by saying that um, in, I think it was March, I attended a fantastic cross-border um, exercise run by your fantastic borough commander in Richmond, so I know they do happen, but why, why, is, this, um, why is this the case across the board? Because uh, it was neglected, basically. We didn't have a central system for coordinating. It was left to individual boroughs who bordered um, neighbouring services, and we've got a lot around London. So it was delivered locally without a form of central control. So I, I don't think I, I can do anything other than acknowledge the rightful criticism within the report. Again, that exercise you're on um, is a manifestation of a changed approach, which is now uh, a central plan driven through local plans to make sure that each borough that borders another service is conducting the right cross-border exercising. If we talk about sharing of information, which was another significant bit of criticism, we are in the process of ensuring that hydrant data, which is one of the main things you need, is on our current gen generation of MDTs. The technology we've got doesn't share operational risk plans, and that's consistent across most of the services, uh, unless they've got shared controls and shared systems around the outside of London. The next generation of mobile data terminals will enable us um, to pick up other services operational plans, but until we've got them and that refresh um, completes mid 
next calendar year um, we will at least share everything we can within our own systems across service borders okay so i'll come on to that in a second but in terms of the exercises i've got 2020 to 20 21 there are 1.9 exercises with neighboring services per thousand firefighters has that improved in 21 22 i couldn't give you the figures i haven't got them in front of me but we'll, we'll write to assembly member rogers with that and my expectation is that it has to and will okay so you've, you've, you say you've set up central control of this now yeah so we've got a central function now that looks at the the risk cross border and and delivers a coordinated approach to exercising that's relatively new and we'll need to embed and roll out but i think what you've experienced is the initial thing which was a message to local borough commanders even in the absence of that to say get on with doing it basically okay absolutely and that the one i attended was clearly risk-based it was about the river which is a significant yeah. risk in that part of part of the world and requires joint operation so is it going to be a risk-based approach that you take to these exercises? yeah because actually we've got significant risks that circle under so if you're in heathrow for example you you need to exercise with surrey uh, and others because there's a convergence of three um different authorities there um if you are you know in the in the northeast back at, again on the thames you're into the thames valley where you've got some very significant ports that we will end up responding to in essex so I, I could point to multiple individual examples of where that approach will be particularly focused on significant risks both in neighboring areas and in ours where they will come onto our our patch thank you and you you, you touched on um sharing information between services um, I asked a question last year about uh, London Fire Brigade attendance uh, in, in, on Surrey's grounds because it's the one that makes the most sense for, for my constituency. Trendline very much going up in 2016, 124 incidents in 2020, um, 288 incidents. So that's becoming an increasing issue. Um, reversely, Surrey attending on London Fire Brigade is decreasing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite clear you know, we're sending uh, London Fire Brigades to assist other fire services you've mentioned the mobile uh, data terminal uh, information which is good but what else are you doing to make sure that when uh, london firefighters go to other uh, services that they are being properly supported and have the information they need um it's a revised approach in terms of our operational delivery so validating what we already do in terms of sending support officers across making sure that that cross-border exercise is happening sharing of information they're they're the basics good local um, cooperation between local commanders and commanders on the other side. I've got to say there is a political and resourcing dimension to this, which is, you know, it's not for me to turn to another service and comment on their resourcing, but you have articulated an inescapable fact, which is, I think, in Surrey, that there are some questions to ask about the level of cover on our boundary and the volume by which we respond. I mean, we do cost recover, by the way, so this is not done at cost to London and Londoners we're very clear that we cost recover on this but it's not an ideal situation for me you know because the minute we're outside London we're not covering the risk in quite the way I want us to in London uh, and I am mandated to do it by mutual aid protocols it's, it's, it's you know it's a big decision to step away from that so I mean I, I would appreciate any support um, with, with colleagues who have you know links into Surrey just to kind of reinforce the point that we need proper resourcing around the boundary you can't rely on London to provide that into other false areas that question I asked which was uh, for Surrey it, does that trend line hold true for other um, other areas as no, well? no not everywhere I think Surrey is a particular point of vulnerability so if I look at Kent and Essex there, there's a there's a you know I'd have to get the numbers but it's a it's a much more equal exchange of resourcing for example okay interesting thank you uh, chair I've got my other question but I'll leave that until right. just, uh, Dr. Sorry, I, just, I just wanted to come in on the point the commissioner made about resourcing and I think that this goes back to what risks do all um, fire services within the sector sort of how do they respond to them together and I think that one of the changes you'll see in the CRMP when it comes back is an increased focus on the issues relating to climate change and the cross-border dependency was particularly stark when you saw um, huge fires across the whole of the southeast and actually um, at a sort of political level we've already started having those conversations sort of nationally about actually um, 
what worse day are we resorting to, not just within individual fire services, where I think the potentially has been an over-reliance on where you've got those stations just across um, the boundary in London, we can rely on those, or they factor them into to their planning for their worst day. If their worst day is the same as London's worst day, then we've all got a problem. Uh, and it's actually not just their problem, it is our problem as well, that we need to talk about resourcing collectively. Um, and it is something that we discussed with the former Home Secretary when she came to visit Wennington to see the impacts of the, the fire. But I think um, that's something that I would be keen for, um, for us to look at more within the context of how you... It's, it's, you can't always, as the inspections do, take one service separate from all the other ones around it because ultimately um, uh, the worst day in London might be the worst day for Surrey or Kent or Essex. And it, it, you can't really distinguish between those. Okay. Thank so you. It's, but it's good to hear that it's, it's on the sort of political radar um, as a, a national issue. So excellent. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, thank you. And I see John on the screen wants to come in. Yeah, thank you. So just, just to actually echo what Fiona said, yeah, I mean, we're looking in the last 10 years, I think central government have cut all fire services roughly regarding like a 40 percent real terms cut we're resourcing you know I, I would argue you know fiona's right if you if everyone's resourced to their worst day and the worst day happens on the same time and people are relying on other brigades to carry the carry the slack it it'll all go wrong and actually i think we really need to see changing what we're talking about so we're actually we're resourcing past our worst day because actually as we've seen recently we keep getting more worse days, you know, that was no one was expecting. So we should be looking at actually an all brigade should. And and Andy was right. If we've got five, six machines in Surrey, they're not in London where they may be needed. So I, I would just echo it. It's a national issue. But like I said, it, it does have implications in London. Thanks for that. Assembly Member Polanski. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, guests. Uh, just picking up on the exact conversation we we're just having. So if I can turn to you, Commissioner. Uh, recently we visited the control room and saw the phenomenal work that they're doing there and how they keep their ability to keep cool under pressure is very impressive um, along obviously with the people out on the front line um, we saw the big screen which showed where the fires were happening I think we were there a week after the wildfires and the worst day since World War Two and this exact conversation happened then in terms of how unpredictable some of these things are where you have to then move resource either cross boundary or even around london uh, so it's good to hear those conversations are happening um we're now facing an energy crisis and it's looking like power cuts are uh, uh, they're not just hypothetical now they're, they're looking like they could be a possibility in the near future in terms of multi-agency working what work is being done, for instance, if people are stuck in lifts, for instance, on the same day that you've got wildfires going on, or there's a kind of a chain link of events? And um, you can think of various scenarios where actually things can very quickly get out of control. So I think it'd be useful for the Deputy Mayor to come in as well with it, because obviously she has a lead for resilience in London. I'm going to say in London's defence, I think there's a very um, well tested uh, multi-agency arrangements that can be stood up very, very quickly to deal with convergent events so actually last week and the, and the kind of what i think was a colossal and incredible effort um, from london kind of plc on behalf of her majesty um, is a good example of that so that was stood up literally at two hours notice uh, and then ensured that london was safe for the greatest influx of people that any of us will have experienced in our lifetime that is an example of how in london multi-agency partners whether it's policing fire local authority health can pull together very, very quickly. I've actually got a lot of confidence in that. I've spent most of my working life as a senior officer in the middle of that, whether it was the 2011 riots, whether it was the wildfires this year, whether it was actually, you know, despite the challenges for LFB, the multi-agency response to Grenfell. Um, so I think the answer is it's continuous. I, I meet with my counterparts at a senior level continuously, both formally and informally. Um, the, the London resilience arrangements are running continuously. You're able to step them up within hours um, fully, and, and it starts before that, you know, within, within 10, 15 minutes, things are happening. So I think I'm actually pretty confident about our ability to deal with large scale offence. They're always challenging though. You know, you're, you're constantly having to look ahead and horizon scan for what is the 
worst likely combination of all those things that are on the national risk assessment you know whether that's civil disorder combining with a major societal event like the funeral last week whether it's wildfires coinciding with an energy crisis that might have led to blackout and, and a different sort of pressure i think all those things are being thought about i know there's well thought out plans about energy shortages we're part of that conversation can i just ask before i come to the deputy mayor just to to come back on that um so operation london bridge had obviously been planned meticulously for years and was an incredible operation are the lessons to be learned then from how meticulously that had been planned in advance compared to some of the more unpredictable events that are looking more predictable as time goes on uh, i think there's always lessons to be learned from any significant event whether planned like london bridge although what, what i would say about london bridge is whilst the high level plans were obviously meticulously thought out no one could really understand the scale of what was going to happen in london you know you can talk about the planning surrounding a queue when you actually get a queue that's five hours it's the longest queue ever seen in the world actually that those plans only give you your top level detail you know those plans didn't express the fact that we had to resource to put at least 10 appliances with crews on that queue 24 7. you know full credit to colleagues in the fbu to support in that you know and, and making sure that they supported their members mobilized their members as we mobilized our firefighters to do that that's not in that plan that's an example of a need being exposed through the strategic partnership at an operational level and then us responding very quickly or actually an understanding of the biggest protective security operation London's ever seen. So, I mean, the Met were immense in this. But the pressure on us was colossal because no one had really understood the amount of premises that was going to occupy. We, you know, we didn't know at the start of that plan that we would have to inspect genuinely mm -hmm. every single transit, transport hub in London over the course of two days, that we would have to visit over 500 residential hotel properties so that protective security individuals could go into them. You know, so whilst the plan's there, we've got plans for climate. We will develop plans for um, energy shortage. They're, they're already well made. Actually, my experience is the value is in the ability of the strategic partnership to come together and then flex them and amend uh, in, in the face of the operational reality on the ground. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor, I know you wanted to come in. Um, I did. So I think that um, uh, you would rightly expect, and I have um, uh, spoken to partners about the possibility of power outages. Um, uh, we're in the process of sort of drawing up sort of what we think could happen over the winter. So we've got a draft document where the, and it's a tried and tested method that we've used within the partnership when we haven't been able to get um, the government's reasonable worst case scenario planning assumptions. We're working up our own ones in London um, and we will be developing those further with partners. But every single piece of the, all the issues that are there, so power outages or um, uh, winter storms and so forth or flooding, uh, they do have those frameworks in place. It is the concurrency that the Commissioner has mentioned that presents particular risks. So um, we'll know more about power supplies when the um, uh, documents from the industries and uh, UK power networks come out um, at the beginning of October. Um, but it is clear that if there is a sequence of bad things happening all at once, uh, things might be a little bit more stretched than normal because uh, obviously we've got the war in Ukraine, we've got um, an energy crisis. So I think we have to plan for every single bad thing happening all in one day, which we have seen um, happen on a number of occasions. It is, it is, not, it is not new that more right. than one bad thing happens on one day and something happens as a sort of ripple effect or cascade effect from that. So we will plan for it. But we wouldn't want to panic people about things that might not happen. I would hope it would give people reassurance that we are planning for the worst day. But it's those relationships between people and the ability to work through issues as they arise, which uh, the Commissioner has alluded to in terms of some of the things that came up during the um, management of Her, Majesty, Her Majesty's laying estate and the arrangements around the funeral. Um, it is those relationships that are key and even working through things that might theoretically happen helps develop those relationships and make sure that when things do happen pe people know who they're working with and actually 
Um, it's it's a London Resilience Partnership in every single sense of the word. I think it's it's a remarkable group of people who do everything they can to um, keep London's resilience as strong as it can be in the face of uh, of practically different challenges every day of the week at the moment at times. So um, um, I'm happy to sit down with you when we've got a bit more detail around that and, and talk through some of the issues and how we think we could we could address them should they happen. One of the key things will be communication and it's come through some of the things that the Commissioner said, sort of communication to the public, making sure people don't panic is is as important as uh, as sort of quite a lot of the other issues. In Definitely, because the panicking could be part of the cascading that you were talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely, yeah. but it's a natural instinct. It's a natural yeah. instinct. And I think we, we shouldn't we shouldn't criticise people for wanting to um, wanting to increase their own resilience, but we need to make sure that where where there are gaps in resilience, particularly where people don't have disposable incomes, that we've got plans in place for how those would be met. Thank you very much. Um, turning to John now, um, while we're talking about grim scenarios, I apologise. Uh, moving on to marauding terrorist attacks, uh, I know there's been a, a deal made between the Fire Brigade Union and the Fire Brigade. Uh, are you confident that's paved the way for all firefighters to receive appropriate training um, in the instance of marauding terrorist attacks? So there, there is an agreement between the London Region and the London Fire Brigade. Uh, we're still in discuss. Well, we're, we're still organising the training and all that, but there is an agreement. So once our members are trained and that's all finalised out, that you know. Hopefully, that will be enough. Um, are there any concerns that you have still that it won't be enough or anything you need that needs to be paid attention to? No, we're, in, we're still in dialogue with the London Fire Brigade about what the training would look like, uh, when it will be completed, how it will be done. So I'm, I'm sure we'll get there. Thank you very much. Um, I still have a question for Matt, but obviously I'll hand back to you. Thank you. We're going to move on to our last section as Matt hasn't rejoined the meeting. There are going to be just a few questions from this section that get asked when he returns. Um, our, final, uh, our final set of questions is around creating a positive work culture, which uh, Assemblymember Cooper is going to lead. Let me just put on my microphone as well. That might help. Um, I think this is probably um, the bit that where it needs to change from the top of the organisation to the bottom of the organisation. Um, so we need to know not just that it's something that um, that the London Fire Commissioner is focusing on and the Deputy Mayor for Fire, but also that um, John and all the members at whatever level, whether that's a borough commander, station commander, or just a, a you know, firefighter in a in a day to day watch. And I think um, you know that sort of chain um, of getting that sort of created and changed from the top of the bo top of an organisation to the bottom is so important. And one of the things that seemed to have come out in the report is um, the description of staff as having an us and them um, culture at the uh, at the LFB. Is that something that you recognise, Andy? And I'm going to come on to you as well, John. And is that something that you know, we are starting to tackle? Yeah, I completely recognise it, and it'll be one of the most significant obstacles to progress if we don't um, change that. Because as far as I'm concerned, we're one team. Responsibility for leadership and, and the culture starts at the top, not at the bottom. I have to set the standard by my own behaviour, what I model, what my senior leadership team models, and then delivers into the organisation. I expect that to be replicated at every level in every part of the organisation. So that's the first thing I'd say. And I've always been in a place where I expected the culture review to stretch from my office to IT, to the shop floor on fire stations. Um, why, why have we got a them and us culture? Years of painful industrial relations legacy, a lack of investment in training. Again, I spoke this into the inquiry. When I sat as commissioner in front of uh, this committee, the last formal piece of face-to-face -face leadership training I had received courtesy of the London Fire Brigade has been a, had been as a leading firefighter 15 years before. So you, that change will come when we've both set the standard clearly, communicated that standard clearly, held people to account when they don't meet the standard, but embody our leadership um, with a compassion and a kindness and a robustness that is commensurate with an emergency service delivering a vital range of, 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 of kind of services to London. So 
the answer is I'm very, very focused on this. I think it's the single largest obstacle to making and sustaining progress. Um, and that them and us culture does no one any good. There needs to be clear boundaries mm -hmm. and understanding of responsibilities and accountabilities that leaders on watches particularly need to see themselves as slightly different from the watch. But that doesn't mean that the watch shouldn't look to them for their welfare, for their guidance, to trust them. So that there needs to be both a degree of professional separation for our leaders, embodied by a kindness and a focus on standards that I don't think we've got yet. And that's not about the people themselves who have all the potential to get there. It's about the lack of investment in the, that the institution has made over many, many years. And it, it has to start with me, it has to start at the top, and then we drive it down and through every single rank in the organisation. Yeah, it's been something that's come up, I and mean, I've referred earlier on to having worked on big organisational um, change um, processes and people talk about either the golden thread running from the top to the bottom of an organisation, the stick of rock mentality so that everyone sort of, you know, if you chop their arm off they'd all kind of say, you know, London Fire Brigade, gold standard, you know, in their arm, um, you know, the, or a green thread sometimes when people are doing environmental change. I, I just wondered, John, um, how, how you think that people um, out there on the ground in the watch feel about this because I've been always so impressed whenever I go into a fire station the sense of camaraderie and the very strong sense of team that you get from whether it's blue watch white watch red watch whoever it is that you're talking to but I have also when I've been there sitting in the mess room usually having a, a cup of something um, sometimes heard people um, expressing views about senior management um, and also I have heard people being you know, disrespect. I mean, disrespectful actually, particularly towards Danny Cotton. There was some disrespect towards her, be not because she wasn't a great firefighter, but because she was a woman. Um, and I just wondered if you think that that's something that everybody does understand that we need to be moving on from, because it is difficult if you're a woman and you come in as a firefighter and most of your watch is male, and then you have to put up with that. And I think Assembly Member Bailey referred earlier on to the difficulties of someone who, you know, in the end, very sadly. Um, actually committed suicide and again I think felt you know that people didn't understand him and he was made to feel different is that something that firefighters are now starting to to take on board do you think I think you know this should be a welcoming service and everyone should be happy to be here I, I get the point of the us and then there is there does seem to be a bit of that that does come from of years of you know station closures things like that I think sometimes it's the us and them comes from the sometimes people at fire stations don't always think they're being listened to and that could be for a host of reasons whether that's you you know you want to move and you can't get it or you you feel like people aren't listening but i mean it is it is an obstacle that needs to be overcome i mean no one should be sitting at some and you know having issues with people because of their gender race sexuality or any of that uh but like i said the us and them i think is much more to do with Sometimes I think people think there's a ceiling and actually I think, you know, if if Andy leads the way, once that makes its way down, I mean, it's a consistency approach as well. So people at different boroughs are sometimes treated differently. People at different areas are sometimes treated differently. There's sometimes people read policies for certain things in a different way. I won't go into specifics. You know, I, I, I could mention how sometimes that happens, but I think, you know, we would like that. You know, we are one service. But there is work to be done. Thank you. And I think that's really welcome to the committee to hear that um, the FBU representative who's here today is talking about the need for work to be done. And I think obviously we hear that from Andy and we've heard it also from previous commissioners. Um, I'm going to bring in um, the Deputy Mayor for Fire and Resilience. But um, Matt, um, we also wanted to find out your position on this whole thing about the workplace culture and how concerned um, HMIC is about the uh, workplace culture and, and do you feel that other fire and rescue services, I know you don't like to do these um, invidious comparisons, but is this something that you've, I mean I think in any large organisation turning turning the ship around, I think it was Frank Dobson who talked about turning around the super tanker of the health service for example. Is it a concern and um, do you think the London Fire Brigade has, has got worse problems than other brigades? Uh, it's got problems on a bigger scale than other brigade, brigades is the obvious conclusion to that. Sure. You do see some where this, this sort of stuff just isn't there. 
uh, and there is um, and you talked about that golden thread or whatever it was you see that in some places everybody buys into the message you don't get the carping against the senior management the us and them feeling uh, and it's very impressive and I think as I said earlier on it's quite humbling when you see that working in some ways and that's not necessarily in the tiny rural ones that's 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 some others we inspected um, there isn't one LFB culture there'll be you know there'll be a culture in one bit of the organization that's different to the others but in general I think we did find uh, and during our inspection some some quite some quite sh troubling uh, example of the way people relate to each other uh, lack of respect uh, lack of um, uh, thoughtfulness uh, sometimes lack of respect for, for, for the command chain as well uh, that, that we don't necessarily see everywhere else. We do see it in pockets in other places clearly this is not a London unique problem I just think one of the consequences of London it's just on a bigger scale than, other, than others. I'm very much looking forward to reading the, uh, the culture review uh, be fascinated to see what it says. Um, I also think there's something um, and forgive me again Chair for d dashing out because I'm talking about a different London uniform service uh, this morning as well and, and I do think London faces challenges that are, are it's just harder to, um, to get around for, for leaders such as the Commissioner or his top team to get around the way, the way others do. We had a we had for many years we had a uh, a police service that was quote top of our league tables we don't issue league tables but if we did they would have probably been top and it was durham constabulary and, and if you went to durham it, it was like if you went out with a couple of uh, uh uh pcs on patrol it was like the chief constable was in the car uh they all spoke yeah well the chief doesn't like us doing this no we don't do this because and it was it was a fantastic feat of sort of inspirational leadership that worked in a force where the chief knew by name every sergeant. So getting a relatively small organisation to, 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 to exhibit that golden thread is a totally different proposition to getting a London-wide organisation, be it police or fire, to, to act in the same way. It is all, I'm delighted to hear that Andy intends to go to every station, uh, and that's a good thing, and why wouldn't he, and be wrong if he didn't. And, and he's not, of course, I'm not saying he's naive enough to think this, but the idea that the commissioner going to every station is, is, is tick job done, it only works if everybody at every level through the organisation buys into what the commissioner is trying to achieve. Yes, that's uh, why the golden thread is so important. That's why and, it's such and why I've really appreciated the borough commander allowing me to sit with the watch without sitting in the room because obviously that changes the dynamic if you've got the senior staff there. I also think it's very welcome that um, uh, the deputy mayor for uh, fire when was when the chair of this committee went to every station and i believe also assembly member hall has also done exactly the same so i think but, but us turning up to things isn't the same as uh, you know and that's why it's important to hear what john and the fbu ordinary member on the ground of the service is thinking i think you wanted to come in as well uh, deputy mayor um i i did because this golden thread that people are talking to only happens if you've got the processes in place to make sure it happens if you've got the sure. values set and agreed and everybody sort of signed up to and you've got the communications in place to make sure things are understood at every single level and I think earlier um, our colleague from the FBU referred to the fact that actually there was still a piece of work to do in terms of that comms piece about the CRMP it's process comms values and it's kind of you don't just get it by having values that are sort of written down on a piece of paper but not communicated or understood or lived you don't get better behaviors in place unless you've got the processes to deal with bad behaviors and the training so that people understand how to deal with things and also sort of understand sort of how um behavior should be done you've got um um uh, a really constructive um uh approach to industrial relations both by the regional fbu and by the brigade in which the FBU can raise serious issues and they are listened to and dealt with for the benefit not just of their members but for the people in London and I sort of just want to go back to I, I, I did put my hand up but I didn't get called in on the point of the discussion around MTA that is a classic example of a trade union negotiating something of benefit to their members that is of massive benefit 
to London and Londoners in the face of one of the biggest threats we face as a city. So I just wanted to make sure that was noted and my thanks to the FBU and to the brigade for that are sort of recorded um, while we've got John Lamb present. Um, oh. But it's that process mm. piece that yes. I think is, is missing if we talk about a, a, a golden thread because yeah. something has to hold that together and that's process. So I'm actually just going to, I've got a couple more questions. I'm just going to reverse them slightly because I just want to come back to John on the issue of um, do you feel that what needs to take place to enable staff to speak out when, if there is an issue of bullying or discrimination that has happened, do you think staff feel that they can speak out and know who they can go and approach to support them? Um, because t tackling uh, these issues isn't going to um, start to move forward unless people know who to go to and feel comfortable in doing that? I think there's still some work to be done. Uh, I mean, we have obviously the grievance, the, uh, grievance procedure, bullying and harassment complaints, but there is, there is still work to be done to make it actually easier, I think, for people to raise their grievances and if they feel they're being mistreated. We are having discussions with the London Fire Brigade on certain policies. They're working through them at the moment. Uh, there's stuff they could do to make it easier and, and actually make it clear. But, you know, we are working on that. So finally then, Andy, obviously that's something that's being worked on. Um, I would actually like to congratulate the, the Brigade on um, asking Nazir Afzal to undertake a culture review. What are you doing to address the issues that John has just mentioned about, you know, working th things through? And what are you doing in advance of the, the culture review coming out to address the issues that have already been um, identified in the, in the HMIC report as well? Uh, not waiting for the review, not least because I, uh, there's a cause of concern that I agree with that we need to provide a really um, clear action plan against. Um, uh, Culture, leadership and our ability to consistently communicate and drive the right standards consistently through that communication is the biggest challenge. I think that's come through loudly, hasn't it, in this committee. Uh, what are we doing? Well, it's everything from expanding the Safe to Speak um, programme that we piloted um, following the death of Jaden, Francois Esprit. So widening that out, learning some of the lessons from that pilot uh, and, and ensuring that there is actually a, a neutral safe space um, monitored from outside LFB to a set of external standards where people can speak into if they actually don't have confidence in the grievance process, if they don't feel their manager is the safe space they can go to. Um, it's, again, it's implicit within what we communicate to people on the leadership programmes we're putting people through. Actually, it's in simpler things like just getting in person all 200 senior officers responsible for delivery into our operational workforce together into one room and laying that out from me from AC fire stations what I expect because actually I think the single biggest point of failure if we want to talk about where the bulk of the workforce is is the interface and the relationship between station commanders and watch officers and the failures in that relationship were built over decades so it will take some time to reverse so it's about station commanders being confident um, officers who can hold the right standard but do so with kindness and act as a, a, an appropriate um, place of communication for watches to raise concerns, be heard, to know that the kind of the beginning of our service starts with the welfare of our people because otherwise there won't be the trust to hold people accountable and deliver the service to the right standard. That requires training, it requires reinforcing a message that was never out there really before in any consistent or corporate organized way you know we didn't again you talk about things i didn't have i didn't have a set of behaviors when i took over the brigade we didn't have a behavioral code we didn't have the national code of ethics that sits behind that now now we've got those structures now we've got those discussions happening openly with my colleagues in the fbu i'm very certain it's that interface particularly for the bulk of the workforce between watch and the first rank of senior command that must get resolved both parties have got to trust each other. Both parties have got to understand their responsibilities. Both parties have got to deliver leadership with both kindness and compassion, but also a robust approach in what is a, you know, a vital emergency service. 
I'd love to dig into that further, but thank you very much for what you said. I know that the chair is uh, going to be unhappy if I um, go into more detail because I know we're coming to the end of our meeting. But can I also just say on a personal level, thank you very much um, for the brigade, not just um, for the work done during the London Bridge um, around Her Majesty's funeral, but also all the work over the summer on the endless grass fires as it felt at one point. So thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. I, um, well, while you were out of the room, Matt, there was a few questions for you, and I, I don't like to normally jump around on me, but I am aware you have uh, another pressing matter today. So I'm going to jump back into the previous section, and then um, I, I realize we're, we are slightly over time at this point, but I would like to wrap up in the next 10 minutes. So I'm just going to take Assemblymember Rogers has a question, and then Assemblymember Polanski. Thank you, Chair. Um, Matt, we were looking at uh, the, uh, the brigade's response to major and multi-incident, uh, uh, multi-agency incidents uh, earlier. Um, it, was, it was it was good to read that um, that uh, you found that LFB is quite well prepared for major incidents. But what I was concerned to read um, was uh, that um, Jessup wasn't always being followed, and particularly that um, incident commanders, uh, that not all of them that you interviewed, were familiar uh, with it or, or had had training on Jessup. Now, um, Joint Emergency Services Interoperability Principles is not particularly easy to say, but it is very important um, in my uh, roles, former role as a railway station manager and railway incident controller. Um, I had training on Jessup, and at its heart, it's a way of sharing information and making joint decisions. So if you've got um, incident commanders who are operating to different decision-making models, that raises uh, the possibility of confusion and uh, erects more barriers. So w what did you find in your discussions around Jessup, and why is Jessup such an important thing for firefighters to know about? Uh, crikey, I, I thought by stepping away for 10 minutes, I got away with that <laughs> one, but, uh, but, but, but thanks. Um, it, incident Command is, uh, particularly in London, if I may say, is a fascinating challenge for, for the London Fire Brigade. Um, Commissioner and I have had this debate before. Uh, my view is that uh, it is simplistic and wrong to equate senior levels of Incident Command with whatever rank they happen to hold in the, in the London Fire Brigade. You should select a core of people and invest more heavily in them rather than spread it over a, 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 a wider cohort. Um, and the reason is that, that incidents in London have the potential to very rapidly become significantly more complex than they do in other parts of the country. Not all, but you know, in general that is. Uh, and in addition to that, they are inevitably going to involve other uh, emergency services. That's just the way of life in London. It's inconceivable that there would be a major fire incident that wasn't uh, a, a major um, cross-emergency service incident. The exercise programme has been uh, held up to some degree over the last couple of years. It has been interrupted by the pandemic. Uh, when we inspected, and, uh, and the Commission may say things have improved since, but when we inspected, we weren't convinced it was, it was quite at the level it should be. Uh, it wasn't testing enough for those incident commanders, particularly in JESSIP principles. Uh, and yes, you're right, some of the, 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 the people we talked to uh, didn't have the uh, competency we would expect. Um, I think. I think, in general, there's incident command training has has improved quite markedly over the last uh, since since our first report. I think where the nervousness I have is that um, it, it's training for the unexpected. Uh, it's training for the things that are almost too unexpected to be able to train for, and in those cases, you have to rely on the qualities of the people and their understanding of the principles that lie behind what they're trying to achieve. So that's why we made the observation uh, in the report about incident level training. Um, I do think, however, you know, London is one of those places where, uh, and I'm sure the Commission will tell you, uh, the degree of cooperation and interaction between all three emergency services is high. It has to be. Uh, so this is not one of the things that worried me the most about the LFB, but but it's just a nagging fear. Um, and, and you you have those moments where you imagine what's the worst that could happen and how reassured are we that it would be dealt with in a in a professional uh, fashion that, that that when the when all was said and done you look back and think yeah that went bad as well as it could possibly have been expected to 
Um, that's a nagging doubt that I would have if I was a commissioner. Well, I suppose um, knowing that incident commanders had uh, good knowledge of Jessup would be one of the ways that you could be reassured that things would, would go would go better. Of so, course. I mean, uh, Andy, um, what are you what are you doing to address this? Um, and also, also uh, another question: How um, do we get to a point where um, incident commanders didn't know what Jessup was? I think again, it's about the legacy of investment in training. Full stop. So, the wider package of training that Matt's referred to, the very significant improvements in instant command training um, involved the rollout of a much deeper kind of um, um, investment in people understanding Jessup. But again, inspection is a point in time. So at the point the inspectors come in, we had addressed the most obvious issues around instant command that arose from the Grenfell Tower inquiry. That's where our focus had been, you know, where our courses were run, the length of it, making sure we just had actually got the bare numbers that we needed. Um, the second phase of that included JSIP, included the introduction of kind of the national approach to decision making. Um, so where we're at now is, um, so various examples if you, if on the numbers, 89% of all of our frontline staff have now completed training in the updated approach to JSIP. So we've still got 11% to go, we're not there yet. 91% uh, of all frontline staff have completed the Joint Multi-Agency Actions Counterterrorism Training Package. All 240 senior officers are trained in joint operating principles now. So we're working our way through. Actually, Matt's point is the one that keeps me awake, which is what happens at the point your policies, your procedures, your knowledge of JESSIP run out because you're standing in front of Grenfell or you're down in the cut on the tram crash or you're in the middle of serious civil disorder. That comes back to the much longer um, and more deep-seated change required around behaviours, confidence, um, leadership in instant command. For a very long time, we never spoke about leadership and instant command in the same sentence. One of the things that got baked into the new strategy for instant command is taking the behaviours and looking at how people communicate beyond the procedure of instant command. So it's not just about knowing what you might need to do, it's how you do it, and then being able to apply base principles. The integration of all our policies into the national operational guidance model has been very important in that. You know, again, at the point of, of, of inspection, we weren't far enough along. We're now in a place where our policies are compliant, but we need to go further still to ensure that people operate to base understanding of principles, taking their leadership of babies into account. And clearly, I have a personal interest in this because I've had to front the service following the very painful failures that were demonstrated at Grenfell. You know, the heroism of firefighters the unbelievable stuff I saw firefighters do on the day is beyond doubt. It's the most moving and, and humbling experience of my life to watch firefighters inside the Grenfell Tower. What was the greatest shame to me is that we had not supported those firefighters, nor the officers who were exposed to extraordinary risk with the right investment in training and instant command and leadership. And that is where we were exposed. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Assemblymember Polanski has a last question for Matt, and then I then uh, you, you can slip out, and then we just have a, a few questions for the Deputy Mayor and Andy after which, because um, I am aware that you you were on tight time. So go ahead, Assemblymember Polanski. Thank you, Matt. Uh, this might be a very similar conversation, so feel free uh, if you don't have additional comments. But the inspection talks about LFB having a limited response to terrorist uh, incidents due to a lack of training amongst non-specialist staff. Um, how concerned are you about this and how much of this is back to the qualities conversation as opposed to you, you can't train for everything? Um, I think the easiest way, uh, Andy's made the point a few times that the inspection's a point in time. Uh, I think he will say that, that things have moved on from our inspection at the time. Uh, 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 this worries me less than it does in some other fire and rescue services. My, my general view of Fire and Rescue Service preparedness for a terrorist attack, indeed police ter preparedness, is that uh, as long as any incident comes in London, uh, there's a better chance of it being dealt with, and the real risk in the UK lies in some somewhere coming where, frankly, uh, police and fire leaders just think about it less than they do here. Uh, so um, there are some gaps, or there were at the time of our inspection, some gaps in, in the staff preparedness, but I think Andy will now tell you that they've taken steps since. Uh, and I'm not saying the problem's gone away, but it's probably receded to a position where you shouldn't be too worried at the moment. 
Yeah, so I mean, I was in a position when I took over as commissioner where I had to articulate to this committee that I'd been personally witness to firefighters deployed into terrorist incidents, as we always would here, um, not wearing the correct PPE, with a, a, a knife man running past them, executing their duty to support casualties with utter courage, but um, without, I think, the policies, procedures spread across every part of the uh, brigade to to safely deliver that that response. So London firefighters have never not responded to a terrorist incident. They will continue to respond to terrorist incidents and place themselves in harm's way. That I am confident in, and I am confident the FBU supports in that as well. What I need to see is every frontline appliance riding with the right PPE, i.e. stab and ballistic protection, having undertaken the right cross-agency exercising. Um, we are one of only two services in the country that will have that across the entire workforce. I, I think there is a question for other urban areas as the national counter-terror lead for fire about why the model we've replicated in London, notwithstanding the industrial relations challenges, isn't replicated elsewhere in some of the other large urban areas. It is of note to me that the calls for concern in Manchester has just been lifted and, and I know that we are at least as far along um, as colleagues in Manchester because we built the model and helped them negotiate it nationally to, to achieve that in you know, these two services in the UK. I think the inspectorate was right to criticise it at the point they came in because it's unjustifiable in the face of the risk in London. That That is changing fundamentally. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and thank, thank you, and thank you, Matt, for joining us today. Thank it's you very much, and uh, again, apologies for, for uh, nipping out, but uh, I found the session uh, really productive, um, uh, and I'm glad uh, to have a report that you've taken seriously, and I'm also glad to have a report that the LFB and uh, Deputy Mayor have taken seriously. So. Um, it's a good session from my point of view. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm just going to go back now to Section 5, which is creating a positive work culture. We would finished the main questions, but there were just a few uh, supplementary. So, um, Assembly Member Bakari. Um, you mentioned earlier about the inquest of Jaden's death, and um, there was a, there was no sufficient evidence from that inquest to suggest racism. However, he did talk to his family about being teased, being teased for eating Caribbean food, being called lazy boy. And you've rightly have said you're not going to wait for the culture of you to take action, and I'm pleased about that. You're, you've already got a behavioural code and you're working on that. Will you also include a clear definition of racism and work with the staff and members of the uh, LFB to have real clear training on what racism is and how you can tackle racism within the LFB? Yes. I mean, I think, I think we have a definition there. I think in the training we're already delivering, we're clear about what is and isn't acceptable. Uh, it's, this is not about us being clear. This is about every level of the organisation, and, and it is not just about watches. It is every level. It is in every team. It is at every level of leadership, understanding how those standards and those sets of behaviours are embodied. Um, so I think we're already there in terms of our clarity. What I think we have is a communication challenge. We have um, a journey of cultural change that will be hard because there are still places in the brigade at at every point where there is unacceptable behaviour, where you, there is poor leadership. You say you're doing it, but yet the Inspectorate staff survey said that half of the people who've experienced bullying and harassment haven't even reported it. So there's definitely a lack of trust in the system. 100%. I mean, I think that the figures you've got in the, in the current inspection report were actually a fairly significant percentage improvement on the previous report. But the figures were so bad in the previous report that there is nothing for me to be excited about. So what I think, we think we're seeing is gradual improvement. Um, but we've got to do a lot better. I, I wouldn't pretend otherwise. But that can only, again, it's fine for me to say this, it, it only becomes real when actually you can join as a young woman or as a, a black firefighter or someone who is neurodivergent or actually just someone who's quieter and, and walk into any team in the London Fire Brigade and be treated with respect and actually valued for the difference you bring. That's the journey we're on. We are not there yet. Um, I think we have the structures and the approach in place. I don't think we have always successfully communicated it. I take John's challenge seriously. I think he is right. I think sometimes we have over-theorised rather than just kept this simple. I don't think we have had the volume of conversations we need out on watches and in teams yet to make it real. I don't think we've always got managers in place who are confident enough to have those conversations because their own behaviours may not be where they need to be. This is a cross-organisational piece that is about, I'm afraid, endurance and consistency and clarity 
from my position all the way down and through and coming back to it again and again and again. Thank you. Um, Assembly Member Bailey. Um, thank you. Um, John, this is a question for you. Um, do you represent um, members all across the fire brigade at every rank or, or is it just front line? Just a lower rank, sorry. No, so we have, no, so we represent members. So obviously front line all the way up, you know, a, we, we have got, I believe, ACs that are still members. So if you work for the London Fire Brigade, you can be one of our members and we will represent you. Okay. So, so, so what work are you doing around helping people who are being bullied? Because because you represent such a wide section of the London Fire Brigade, it's effectively your members potentially bullying others of your members. So what work are you doing around helping that situation be, e being eased? Well, so one of the things we're doing, actually all our branch sex area officials, they will constantly be involved in grievances, bullying and harassment, supporting our members. You know, I mean, we will have those conversations with all our members about how they behave. And like I said, we're we're waiting on the culture review because we want to see what comes out of that. But I mean, you're right, sometimes, you know, it may possibly be two members, but we will represent and deal with it as we need to. So, but we constantly do the grievance piece. Yeah, but do you think there's some room for you to run a project around culture change, around interaction, how people work within your membership? Because ultimately, if your role is to provide a great place for your your members to work, surely this is the very most fundamental line of that, how people interact. Because some of the, the grievancy work and stuff, that's your bread and butter, your, your union. But what about these human interactions? Why are you not running the, the, the a project to look at this? Why are you not asking yourselves the same question that the London Fire Brigade is having to ask itself about interaction? So we, we are constantly working on stuff like that. We have our own rule book that we expect people to follow. We've got the officers section, the uh, Women's Action Committee and the, the BEAM section that do a lot of work on this and we're always constantly in discussions with them. So, so do you feel like you're doing enough preemptive work, enough work to create a good environment rather than just reacting when things have gone wrong? We, so we want a good environment. So that is what we want and that is what the, you know, that is what a trade union is here for, that everyone is protected and everyone feels this, they're safe. And that's constantly what we do as a union in London and nationally. Okay, thank you. Chair. Emily Member Hall has a quick question. A very quick question to you, John. John, you, you have said that you're the voice of your FBU members. Of course you are. I read in the Times today that a settlement has been paid to Paul Embry from the union. I can't imagine that your members will be happy about the situation and the way he was treated. So will you be bringing that up at your meeting that you tell us you have later today? So I, I'm not aware of the specifics around that. I'm, I'm sure if it's an all-members meeting, I'm sure if members want to talk about it, it will come up. I do hope so. It's in the Times today, or you can read it on Paul's uh, Twitter. OK, thank you very much, Chair. Okay. And our final question is from Assemblymember Polanski. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, this is for John uh, from the FPU. What do you think needs to take place to enable staff to feel confident in speaking out after being subject to bullying and discrimination? Uh, there's lots of things that could happen. I think, you know, and, and, you know, safe spaces to speak. I think it's, it's the service needs to become a place where we're open and accountable and it becomes easier for people to talk out. I mean, as I alluded to earlier, we are in discussions with London Fire Brigade around particular policies, how they work, what you could think might be barriers to it there. And it's, it's a consistency approach as well. It's, it's an understanding. So actually, when we get to a point where something's agreed and we know how something should work, it's that everyone understands that's how it should work. And, it, you know, it's a comms piece, if I'm honest, and it's, it's the people who are enforcing it or people who might be in positions of power to understand exactly not just what's on the written page, page but the, the truth that runs through it and what it's supposed to do. Thank you very much, John. Uh, turning to you, Commissioner, the report says 15% bullying and 18% of people um, experiencing discrimination, presuming and hoping your target is zero. Um, how are you wanting to get to this? Yeah, I mean, it's got to be a zero tolerance approach because there can't be any room for that. As soon as you accept it, then you're endorsing it. Um, I think all the things we've already talked about. 
So everything from leadership programs to clear cut examples of good behavior driven from the most senior levels, because that's where it starts, reinforced in conversations. Um, actually, being really clear that policies and procedures are not the answer. The minute you're relying on your discipline and your grievance procedures, you failed, because both of those represent a failure of leadership and a failure of behavior, either one of them. That has been our approach in the past. It's either been the stick or the complaint. Whereas actually my experience is that it needs to be resolved before you get to the stick or the complaint, embodied in decent behaviours that people reasonably should expect when they come to work and when they deliver our service. So I think, I think it's multi-layered, it's structural, it's um, communication, it's training, it's a relentless um, zero tolerance approach to where we expose those behaviours you know, a consistent delivery of discipline. John is right to articulate this around consistency. We do not always consistently deal with things well. But his members, my staff, do not always consistently experience leadership in the way I want. But this is a process that will unfold over time um, and you can never stop challenging yourself around it because I'm not sure in a huge organisation operating in the complexity of our environment with the turnover of staff we have, you ever get to the end of that this is a constant kind of attritional approach to driving the right standards. And the inconsistency that's currently sometimes there, is that just historical? Um, I, I think it's easy to turn back and blame the past. No, it's existing now. There'll be people doing things I don't want them to do now in the London Fire Brigade. It would right. be naive of me to say any different. This is about continuously addressing this. Um, uh, and where it's exposed, dealing with it with a rigour as well. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. And thank you to, thank you to you both for your um, contributions today. It was uh, you, a long meeting, and thank you for staying an extra time. You, you may now leave. We have just a couple items of very quick business. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Members. Um, and so just to the committee, can we note the report and today's discussion? Noted. And can we also delegate authority to me as Chair in consultation with party group lead members to agree any output from the discussion? Agreed. And can we note uh, the work program? Noted. Okay, and the date of the next meeting of this committee is the 19th of October uh, at 2 p.m. in this chamber. Thank you Thank all. you, Chair.